All right, good morning. I'd like to call the uh, regularly scheduled planning commission for August 12th, 2021 to order. If you would, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. All right. Um, this morning we have an item that is uh, time certain at nine o'clock. So we're going to go ahead and uh, go to um, item number four, which is the county initiated oh. comprehensive text amendment. Mr. Okay. No, I didn't see Mr. Worth coming. I just make sure he was here. Okay. And uh, just for clarification, uh, sure. Mr. Rutledge, I believe, is participating by Skype. Is that correct? Mr. Rutledge. Mr. Connolly, would you like that I enter the changes to the agenda? Uh, Thank you. Are any of them related to item number four? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I am here. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for <laughs> confirming. So, um, Ms. Knapp, let's go ahead and enter the items, the changes to the agenda into the record, and then we'll go ahead and introduce item number four. But it should be pulled up once you find it. So. Ms. Leiter? Yes. Thank you. PA 2005, Ordinance 27, 2107, County Initiated Comprehensive Tax Amendment, Peril of Law at Compliance Legislative, based on the uh, is revised motion, based on the evidence present, comments made at the public hearing, the technical support documents, and finding the request to be consistent with the County Community Planning Act as codified in applicable portion of Chapter 163, Part 2, Florida Status and the Manatee County Comprehensive Plan 1, I move to recommend to not transmit Plan Amendment PA 2005, Ordinance 2107. Okay. So we have a revised recommended motion. No, Mr. Chair, I think what motion. staff is doing is just giving the alternative motions. There's oh, a typo okay. in one of the alternative motions. Yeah. So they're not recommendations, they're just no. the motion. Yes, so. it's the motion. Very good, thank you. Ms. Lidar, does that conclude the, uh, the revision to the uh, agenda for item number four? Yes. Okay. We have another changes, but it's for item number six. We'll, we'll address that when yes. we go to, okay. the, to the other items. Good morning, Ms. Knapp. Good morning, commissioners. Um, and just to be clear, Nicole Knapp, Impact Fee Administrator on behalf of Public Safety. Um, and to be clear, Rosina was pointing out that there was a typo in the cover sheet of the staff report, gave you two alternative motions, and the bottom one had a typographical error. Okay, bottom one, thank you. And then before I get started, I have public comment that was received yesterday at um, roughly quarter to five that I want to enter into the record because it missed the update memo. Very good, thank you. So good morning, Commissioners. Nicole Knapp, Impact Fee Administrator on behalf of Public Safety. And this morning we're here for um, Parallel Flood Text Amendment. <clears throat> and we're seeking a county-initiated text amendment to the Comprehensive Plan regarding the Parallel Flood Act compliance. In 2015, the Florida legislator pa Legislature passed Bill 1094, which was titled Parallel Flood. The new law specifies mandatory requirements for coastal communities in Florida to address flood risks related to high tide events, storm surge, flash flood, stormwater runoff, and sea level rise. These requirements are to be contained in the coastal management element of the comp plan. <clears throat> Later in this presentation, we'll go over very specific, or we'll go over those requirements and touch on some of the minimum tax amendment necessary to satisfy the requirement. For the county to become compliant with the Peril of Flood Act, the uh, amendment to the comp plan must be transmitted to the state by December 1st of this year and in order to be compliant with the county's uh, EAR, which is the Evaluation and Appraisal Review. So what's an EAR? An EAR is basically a comprehensive audit that takes place every seven years of our comprehensive plan. The EAR evaluates the progress the county has made with implementation of goals, objectives, policies, and maps 
or text amendments to the master plan. <clears throat> As you'll see in the agenda packet, Lisa Wenzel from the Building Development Services Department sent our ear notification letter to the state this past December, uh, a year in advance. And in that letter, it outlines the amendments that the county believes to be necessary to become compliant with um, our comp plan by this December. Uh, this morning's presentation, uh, we're gonna go over our efforts to get through to this point, um, impacts of increased <coughs> flooding, the parallel flood requirements, touch upon some of our data and analysis, and then um, we'll discuss a summary of the text moments at the end. So for the past two and a half years, which I know sounds like a long time, but that's when we began these efforts to start to look at our comprehensive plan um, and how we could become compliant. We were working with the University of Florida and also through a partnership with Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council towards implementing the Parallel Flood Act. As we've moved through the uh, different stages of the project, we have provided presentations, updates to the board, Council of Governments, Manatee uh, leadership staff, and to the public. We kicked off this project first by establishing what we called a, a parallel flood working group. And that consisted of um, representatives from multiple departments, as well as participants from our local mitigation strategy working group, the, the LMS. Um, from those that are in the participating jurisdictions, and, and they each played an integral role at establishing um, our gap analysis and what new policies we needed to uh, in ensure that the comp plan was compliant. In the spring of 2019, so just over two years ago, we were working under a grant. Uh, it was called Increasing Resiliency in the Tampa Bay Communities, and um, staff worked in collaboration with the University of Florida Resilient, Resilient Communities Initiative and the University of South Florida College of Marine Science in leading that grant project. The grant was an effort to support the six county region and Manatee County committed to a countywide uh, support efforts for consistency with the Parallel Flood Act and improving resiliency, focusing on addressing environmental and social vulnerabilities due to extreme weather events, reoccurring flooding and sea level rise. We wrapped up the grant project with a one day workshop uh, that Manatee County hosted at the Convention Center. And the workshop was well attended, over 100 participants from uh, different municipalities, elected officials, uh, local residents, and staff. Under that same grant, and as a pilot for identifying how to complete a vulnerability assessment, which is required as part of the Parallel Flood Act, some of our in-house county GIS analysis built and designed and completed this interactive assessment for completing a vulnerability assessment. And this is just a screenshot of what it looks like on our web page. Um, the inundation mapper demonstrates three types of inundation assessments that were performed and can be viewed. Uh, it's an interactive map on our website. Um, assessments on infrastructure, environmental, and social economic impacts to our county. Each assessment took NOAA's sea level rise data from the Tampa Bay region and identified the overlap with a variety of assets from road inventory and stormwater to mangrove forests to business industry and employment impacts. Each application gives users a chance to interact with the data for a better understanding of what could happen and where. These tools are meant to be um, a guide in making decisions about climate adaptation and can help the county prioritize where to get started in applying uh, these new strategies. <coughs> Uh, more recently, this past September, a year ago, the county was fortunate enough to be rewarded another grant through DEP Florida Resilient Coastline Programs. And through that grant, we were able to wrap up, what we consider wrap up the compliance efforts with the gap analysis of the county's comp plan, the comprehensive emergency management plan, the local mitigation strategy, and the post-disaster redevelopment plan. We also evaluated policies and potential conflicts among the plans. We implemented plan integration, and we also conducted stakeholder engagement under that grant. And then lastly, in, uh, and that grant concluded in March, um, and you'll find a report in uh, the agenda packet. Um, lastly, in March of this current year, we had a Board of County Commissioners work session where we were able to seek additional public feedback as well as hear from the board how aggressive or not they would like to be with implementing the new policy language to meet the Peril of Flood Act. <coughs> Um, at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Mr. Jerry Murphy. He's the faculty consultant with the University of Florida. And um, he's going to walk you through his part of the presentation. Then I will come back up to talk about some of the technical data and uh, wrap up the presentation. Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. <clears throat> Trying to get my technology here. And there for the record, just please state your name. Yes, uh, for the record, Jerry Murphy with the University of Florida. Very good. Thank you. So as Nicole stated, we've been working on this for a little while. We're finally here to you. Um, just a little reminder of why we're doing this, the peril of flood. This is just Hurricane Hermine back in 2016. We've seen other things since then and prior to it. <clears throat> so the impacts of increased flooding have been challenging. They uh, have cost the region nearly a billion dollars in the five years up until 2019. And the climate picture for South Florida by 21 is not, 2100 is not pretty. It's no prettier here. Um, you are in a vulnerable area, and so because of these flooding events that you've had, hurricane events, the state has required that your comprehensive plan address these perils of flood. There are six basic requirements. Um, and they provide for it to be settled in the comprehensive plan in a redevelopment component that outlines the principles that must be used to eliminate inappropriate and unsafe development in the coastal areas when opportunities arise. And then there are six things the component is supposed to do that are mandatory. And those are lined out here. So we took a, uh, an approach to look at the comprehensive plan to see if any of these requirements were already addressed by the comprehensive plan or there was language in the comprehensive plan policies that might be modified to address those requirements. And we did a gap analysis um, and then went on to revise those relevant policies to do so and draft new policies where policies did not address the requirements of the statute. And this is the ordinance in front of you. Um, basically, in the staff review with uh, our cooperation and collaboration, uh, we went through a number of various elements that might have some impact on this, just looking to make sure that we had a thorough review of all the policies. Um, we have condensed those relationships between the elements. There are references back and forth, and you'll see some uh, short exhibits that allow that. And then, of course, the preamble text to the amendment lays out all the various policies that have been affected. Primarily, the uh, aspects are in your packet Exhibit A, definitions, and Exhibit B, the coastal management element. And the reason we have management in brackets there is because that's the statutory language that names the element, and your current element is called the coastal element. And so on the advice of staff, we said we should try and be as parallel as possible with the statute. So that's a minor change in title. And we also looked at the um, plan integration for resilience scorecard. This was part of the grant that we got from DEP to take the comprehensive plan portions that we were looking at and review them under this resiliency scorecard. And what the resiliency scorecard does is try to assign responsibility for the implementation of a policy, make sure the policies are clear, and make sure the policies um, do not conflict with other policies in your other planning documents, such as the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan or the Local Mitigation Strategy. So that review was done, and one of the things that we discovered is that the Comprehensive Emergency Management Plan and the LMS both have policy language within them that basically empowers them to be themselves. And because the Comprehensive Plan is your overarching planning document, those policies have been drawn into the Comprehensive Plan so that they, the Comprehensive Plan then empowers the CEMP and the LMS. So the ordinance in front of you was developed through a process of community engagement. The update of the comprehensive plan is part of the EAR, which is going forward at the end of the year. Um, that peril flood gap <coughs> analysis I told you about. We also took the opportunity to take the coastal management element and align it with the statute. You may recall that prior to 2011, there was uh, Florida Administrative Code Provision 9J5. And many comprehensive plans throughout the state are aligned or organized along that 9J5 criteria, which were repealed by the 2011 Community Planning Act. So we've gone back to organize this along the Community Planning Act uh, framework. Uh, Mr. Chairman, do you mind if I remove my mask? No, I <laughs> Thank you. All right. <clears throat> 
So they're now arranged along the outlines of the Community Planning Act for the coastal management element instead of 9J5. And th that required a little bit of switching around and moving them things about. And that's why there's so much strike through and underline because we wanted to maintain what was there before so that you could see how that they've been tracked through. Then Nicole mentioned the, um, oh, I'm sorry, and also any time we could make the language of the policy more plain, take out extraneous languages, <laughs> change which is to that's where that's appropriate, we did that as well. <clears throat> then as Cole mentioned, uh, there was a DEP resiliency planning grant in 2125, and that was where the um, scorecard came into play, as well as the combination of these other um, comprehensive emergency management plan and local mitigation strategy. And so we're here now at the next steps, public hearings for ordinance transmittal and adoption. Obviously, the legislature in the last session passed a requirement that comprehensive plans now have a property rights element, and so that's something else that staff is going to include in that. I just bring that up to make you aware of it. And then any subsequent amendment is necessary after the policies have been transmitted, reviewed, and finally adopted, transmitted to the state, reviewed, and finally adopted by the county. There, the next steps would then be to develop land development regulations to implement those policies, but that is currently beyond the scope of what we're doing here. And I'm happy with Nicole to answer any questions that you may have. Very good, thank you. Again, for the record, Nicole Knapp. Um, if, could you bring the slide back up, please? Perfect. Um, so you've heard us mention a lot about best practices, checklists, grant efforts, gap analysis, crosswalks, and the vulnerability assessment. Um, and you may be wondering why so much focus on studies, surveys, and data. You'll also notice in your agenda packet there's a 169-page document titled Technical Support Documents which consists of seven, seven different studies, surveys, or reports. Per Florida statute, each coastal management element required shall be based on studies, surveys, and data and be consistent with the coastal resource plan. So to identify the risks to the coastal areas, uh, multiple forms of data, surveys, and analysis were performed, and a vulnerability inundation assessment analysis was prepared. As I told you, that was part of the parallel flood requirement as well. And the compilation of the seven different studies uh, and all the data are conducted over the past two and a half years, um, that data and analysis is attached and will be adopted by reference only as a technical support document. Um, Jerry touched upon some of this, but I'll go through quickly. Um, as you're looking through the exhibits, um, in case it wasn't obvious already, the red language that is um, underlined is new. The red stricken or deleted is obviously um, being removed permanently. The double underline or double stricken means it was existing language moved somewhere else in the element. Not, it's not new. And then the yellow highlighted text is um, they reference Florida statute and they're only as reference only just as a comparison. Once we make it past this hearing, then we move forward to the board. We'll remove those from the exhibits. They, they will not be adopted into the plan. Um, exhibit A is a, um, just in short, it's your definitions. I don't think it's necessary to go through all of those. They're there to implement and support the policies th through exhibits, uh, exhibit B. If you look at exhibits C through I, um, which I, I purposely jumped over exhibit B, I'll come back to that. Um, exhibit C, th C through I are other elements within the comp plan, and they're just some housekeeping ref cross-reference text amendments. Uh, so that brings us to element four, which is exhibit B. Um, I believe it's 150 pages in the strike through and underline version, and then we also provided a clean version in the uh, agenda. As Jerry mentioned, a large um, part of the amendments in exhibit B attribute to the reorg of the language and the alignment <coughs> of Florida statute. Um, this will become a greater assistance with the staff in the future as we have additional amendments. Um, We've also added language that's um, 
like Jerry said, attributed policies to responsible parties within the LDC implementation. Then he mentioned how we have all the LMS and SEMP. That's, again, not, not new. It's being copied over, if you will. And the TBRPC um, early recommendations and guides to our local government was that the LMS contain policies that can, that it already contains policies that can easily be put in your comp plan and help you to meet the peril of flood. There, there was a guidance put out by the region when um, the act was passed to help some of the municipalities on how they could become compliant with the peril of flood. Um, and like I said, Exhibit B is 50 pages. Um, so I'm not trying to minimize the proposed text by any way in the 50 pages, um, but I don't think it's very efficient to stand here and, and go through each of the strike through and underlines. And so I think it's better suited to let the commissioners ask which policies they would like us to look at. We can either put them up on the screen. I have some slides prepared or on the doc cam. Um, and also as the public brings up any concerns about certain areas, we can address those as well. So at this time, I'm just gonna wrap by saying, um, staff's asking for transmittal of Manatee County Plan Amendment PA 2005, Ordinance 2107. This concludes our report. Very good, thank you. Uh, Ms. Knapp, what I would like to do is also open it up for public comment to get some additional uh, input. I've got two speaker cards and then we'll go to- Sure, that's uh, fair. Uh, more of a question and discussion uh, type of um, role here. So the first speaker card I have is uh, Ms. Carol Clark. Thank you, babe. You're doing a good job. I'm going to let you use that. Good morning. If you could state your name. Absolutely. Um, my name is Carol Clark um, with Medallion Home. Um, and um, I have something new since you saw me last. It's a new hip. <laughs> so we're here to talk about the um, peril of flood. And um, in my handout, talk about what um, we recognize that the county is required to include peril of flood in this comprehensive plan. Um, and this, that statute has six requirements to do, meet peril of flood requirements. The bottom three, the county is already doing. So it's the top three that are new or that have not been directly addressed. Um, the county is required to have a coastal high hazard area, a coastal management element. It is not required to have a coastal planning area. The amendment that you see before you has 90 new policies. Now, some of those based on the um, presentation this morning may have been brought over from CMS or LMS and CEMP, but I don't know that you have ever seen those before. It has 50 policies that say will be implemented through land development regulations. And 11 of those policies are specifically directed to the coastal planning area. I think this pro proposed amendment goes beyond what is required. Um, and there are some other concerns that I have with what is specifically being proposed. The first are what I'm gonna carry, characterize as policies that were sort of there before but have been changed. So the previous policy says that buffers of larger than 50 feet may be required. That policy has been changed to say the county will require buffers larger than 50 feet um, in certain circumstances. The second one that I wanna point out, and, and these policies are being changed and they're becoming, in my view, mandates. Um, improving shelter capacity through a variety of things, more shelters, education, or land development regulations, and improving the capacity, the techniques may include things like um, um, having requirements uh, when you evaluate development and um, mitigation techniques. That has been changed, and it now says the county will do this. There is no war in there. They'll do all of these things, including requiring development and redevelopment to maintain adequate available hurricane shelter capacity and requiring mitigation techniques, um, including fair share um, uh, items. 
Okay. We have another one like that. And this is that the, uh, there may be mitigation things that may be required, including fair share contribution. <clears throat> if I could, I'm going to. Yes, ma'am. Um, that now has become must meet these standards, including the mitigation measures. So there are a number of those, and I've highlighted um, several of them in my handout. There are also a number of policies that I'm characterizing as the we will do more policies. We will. Uh, through land development regulations, provide higher standards for stormwater. We will provide higher standards to protect facilities and structures through land development regulations. We will require new development to have more freeboard. Well, the county already requires more freeboard than the um, uh, statutory or the, the uh, requirements of FEMA. And then there are policies in there that I just don't think make sense to be implemented through land development re regulations. These deal with beaches and dunes and Manatee County Comprehensive Plan and Land Development Code deal with the unincorporated area of Manatee County. Now, there may be a beach or dune in unincorporated Manatee County, but those are in the municipalities. But these are all identified as something that will be put in the land development regulations. And the last one, and. Um, is that the requiring that the county, through its land development regulations, will provide minimum construction setback lines for all areas in the coastal planning area that have not been delineated with a coastal construction line. <laughs> coastal construction lines are for beaches. To require that throughout the entire coastal planning area, I'm not sure exactly what it means. So um, as we indicated last month, our coastal policies include maps, they include policies and comprehensive plan, they include land development regulations. We're seeing those piecemeal, some of them have to be done, and our recommendation is that you recommend to the Board of County Commissioners that they transmit only what is necessary to meet the minimum statutory requirements, eliminate other requirements, and then build back so that we have an understanding of where we want to go. Thank you. Okay. Very good, thank you. Uh, the next speaker card I have is uh, Mr. Ed Vogler. If you could please come forward and state your name. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ed Vogler. I'm here today on behalf of Neil Communities and um, related companies. <clears throat> this, of course, is a comprehensive plan amendment that regulates private property. This is not a government works program. This is a regulation of private property. And these, these provisions, if, if you've waded through them as we have, they're very, very substantive. And as Carol Clark points out, they're overreaching, they're inconsistent, don't, don't make sense in many respects. Limiting just to the perils of flood law is very good advice to you. But let me also point this out to you. The perils of flood law that you saw cited in the work and described by the, by the consultant uh, has specific requirements that are supposed to be in this plan, and they are not. They're punting them. And this is really critical. For example, what are the engineering strategies? What are the best management practices? What are the findings that should be made? You can't kick that. And I'm telling you, it's inconsistent with the law. I know this because our team collaborated on writing the legislation, shepherding it through, and this was not the intent of that legislation. It's very inconsistent with that. So those mandatory requirements of the Perils of Flood Act are not met, and I've identified that in the letter that I've provided for the record. There's a few other things that I'd like to just mention to, to illustrate why you should kick all of these things that don't have to be done right now. Shelter capacity and mitigation. There's a state law on this, and this plan is inconsistent with that law. They're, they're just flat inconsistent. And I ask myself as a practicing attorney, what takes priority, the Florida State statute or the Manatee County land, uh, 
uh, comprehensive plan and land development regulations adopted in connection therewith? I hope the answer is to state law. Seawalls. I don't know how many of you, but some people watching in the audience must have a seawall at their house, right? This law prohibits the repair, replacement, and construction of seawalls. This comes as a big surprise to me who has a seawall and uh, paid extra for my land because it did have a seawall. This should be deleted significantly. There's also a series of very, very loose language about density reductions. The ordinance shouldn't allow non-objective density reductions below levels authorized by our comp plan and our maps as a mitigation technique. Mitigation techniques are elevation of land, seawall development, uh, elevation of homes and structures. To arbitrarily say, we're going to take your land, Mr. Chairman, the property that your family has had for 40 years on the coastal waterfront, and simply say, we're going to reduce the density because it's in the coastal area, very, very difficult. The other um, concern, and I'll only be just a couple of more minutes, but maybe after it beeps, exactions. I've listed those here in my letter. There are a series of unquantified and non-objective exactions where, where it simply says the landowner will pay money for something unidentified and unquantified. And these, uh, these are probably unconstitutional, and they will certainly be subject to challenge. They should be uh, eliminated or studied on a constitutional framework. Did you know that this proposes all wetland impacts be eliminated unless there be overriding public interest? We present to you every day projects where we have wetland impacts that are, that are uh, minimum but are necessary, but I don't know that they're overriding public interest. You might say, uh, Mr. Chairman, you might say, well, don't have, that, uh, don't have that roadway connection, you know, just go around the wetland. And you understand the impact that has on a project. We represent a lot of special districts, uh, community development districts and stewardship districts. And those are public bodies. They're created by the county. And I'm wondering if a CDD is a public body that is restricted in the same way that the county is under this document. It's not clear at all. So can a CDD install new infrastructure in a community development district that happens to be in the coastal planning area or the coastal high hazard area? Those are interesting questions not resolved. Uh, public access. There are a series of provisions. They, they've actually gotten better as, as the drafts have occurred, but I just ask this simple question. Is it possible under this ordinance to create a private waterfront community? Is it possible to create a private gated waterfront community on waterfront property owned and proposed for development in this community? I think the answer is no. Docks. Is there current data that supports the limitation of docks? We've had a limitation for a long time, one dock per 100 feet. But you know what? No one regulates the upland boat storage. No one regulates the upland ramps. And I wonder if there's data and analysis to continue that. And finally, there are a series of definitional words that are not defined. I'm sorry, a series of words that are not defined. And they leave for inconsistent interpretation and a very uh, difficult means of enforcement. So I think the advice Carol gave you is very wise. You should limit this to perils of flood requirement, instruct the staff to transmit that, if anything, or defer this until these questions can be answered in greater detail. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. And uh, those were the uh, speaker cards I have. I'll open it up to anybody else in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this, on this matter. Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward? Good morning. If you could just state your name. Hi. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Michael Neal, um, developer and uh, lifelong resident of, of Manti County in Bradenton. Um, I'd like to echo uh, a lot of the comments of Mr. Vogler and Ms. Clark. Um, you know, a lot of the time we spend, you know, maybe an hour here, or I guess we've spent, you know, maybe 36 minutes or whatever discussing this, and then the county spends months and months and months and hundreds of thousands of dollars litigating these matters. Um, we have uh, personal experience of 
litigating comprehensive plan changes and then going to um, district court of appeals, um, you know, governor and cabinet. And, uh, you know, as a private party, we were actually on the same side as the county defending the comprehensive plan. So I think both from a public policy decision and from a legal standpoint, of course, I, I'm not a lawyer. I don't speak to the legal matters. But from a public policy standpoint, we should spend much, much more time making sure these policies are constitutional and are consistent with state law. Um, and it, and it, it'll serve the constituents well, because then we won't have takings. We won't have unconstitutional exactions. We won't have the prohibition on repairing, you know, docks and seawalls. I mean, that to me, that's, that's not, it, it's not my impression of what this body wants. It's not my impression that this body wants to take people's private property rights. And it's not my impression that this body wants to drastically change the character of development in Manatee County. Of course, we want to protect um, our community against, against flood. And, and one thing that's often left out is us as developers, who are liable, obviously, under state statute for 10 years, construction defect, as many of you know, you know, being contractors yourself, we're liable for structural uh, issues with a home. And of course, flooding is, is a major concern of ours. So, um, you know, we're aligned with the public on not wanting our communities to flood, but we definitely don't want um, unconstitutional exactions, unconstitutional taking. So, um, I would urge I would urge um, this bar, this body to uh, take no action today and really focus on um, some of the matters that Ms. Uh, Ms. Clark and, and Mr. Vogler brought up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, if there's anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak on this item, please do so. Again, uh, if you would just state your name. Yeah, good morning. My name is Kathleen Sujit. I've lived in Manatee County for about 10 years, and I've worked in this area for about 20. I've seen the development that's gone on, and I see that it is endless. Um, this gentleman's talking about protecting wetlands and people's lives, and the developers only care about building boxes. And um, I think we should protect the wetlands and stop building on them. That's all I got to say. Thank you. Again, anybody else wishing to come forward? Okay, seeing no one else come forward, we're going to close the uh, public comment portion of the hearing and open it up for some discussion, deliberation. Um, I'll, I'll start. Um, uh, Ms. Knapp, what, can you please uh, explain again what the process was to get to here? Did we have um, workshops or, or uh, user groups, anything like that. I, you know, I'm pretty attuned to what's going on, and I don't recall uh, anything that I might have missed. It, of course, I got a lot of unread emails. But um, how, how did the, how did we vet the information that's being presented today? Uh, good morning. I'm not sure the mic is live. I don't know. It's on. Um. We have had, um, we established a working group. I did mention that in the presentation. Mm -hmm. And that working group consisted of staff from the county, all the, the departments, our local mitigation strategy work group, which is members from each of the participating jurisdictions. And um, we started with that. And then we have had, we had a workshop, one day workshop, that's community outreach. Mm -hmm. And then we've had, uh, we, we had COVID. So through COVID, we were a little bit uh, limited on what we could do. Um, we've had it, the drafts have been on our website um, for 30 days back this past mid-March, I believe, mm -hmm. to mid-April. And then we've also ha involved the planning task force and our development review committee and all those HOAs, and it's went out that <coughs> way as well so we could reach more of the public. Um, and then we had a workshop this past January in front of the board at the convention center um, where nobody stepped forward with any questions, mm -hmm. and the commissioners did not ask any questions either. And that was specific to parallel flood. The workshop this past March was titled Coastal Mapping as it relates to parallel flood or something close to that. Um, and some of these uh, topics were brought up then. But it was not specific to just parallel flood. It was more about coastal mapping. Right. Uh, at the workshop at the convention center was was there a draft available or was it uh, still on uh, more of a, a broader discussion at that, that period of time? No, I believe there was a draft, but I, 
I'd have to, I can't mm -hmm. say with certainty, but I believe there was. Okay. Mr. Chair, yes, if I may, based on my re recollection, the workshop, the convention center focused on, there was some confusion with the FEMA maps mm -hmm. coming forward. Yes. That's correct. And Mr. Murphy had to go over the difference to all these maps. And it took the whole time just to do that. Okay. So there was never drilling down into text okay. changes at that point. Thank you, Sarah. That's, that's correct. That's right. Okay. All right. And um, just in general, Sarah, you may have an opinion on this. It, 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 uh, we've had comments that indicate that there's some inconsistency with, uh, I don't know if statute's the right word, but other documents, uh, other regulatory documents, maybe it, um, it would it would be problematic if some of these things were in, implemented. Is that been well vetted? Well, my I did want to state Mr. Soto was the primary view on this matter, mm -hmm. and both of us had various extensive conference calls with a consultant. We didn't write a big memo on it because anything we say is used against a county lawsuit, so we we did it verbally. <laughs> we had a number of legal issues with it, and, and they fine tuned. Mm -hmm. You know, the exaction. We, we fine tune as much as we could. We were working with a document the consultant prepared. We did not draft this document as attorneys. Right. We still have some legal issues with it. Okay. Um, I don't want to throw Nicole's nap schedule off, and I appreciate the PC's right. position right. right now. I think the board needs to have a workshop on the details of it myself. Because if they if the board substantially changes a lot of what's in here, I don't know if they will, but they might. You have to have another PC hearing for transmittal because it's going to be different. Mm -hmm. So uh, one option for you to do is just continue no day certainly advertise. I mean, if, if that's your flavor, I don't know. Um, with clarification. But um, I think there's going to be changes at the board level made on this document. The other option is to, tra to recommend transmittal with the understanding it might come back to you if the board makes changes. Mm -hmm. Commissioner, or yeah. Madam Chair, if I may. Um, yes, ma'am. I would prefer we not continue to a no dates um, certain and continue to the next planning commission meeting and give us a chance to sit with these two people that have provided comments mm -hmm. yesterday at quarter to five and today here that I don't even have a copy of. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice to go and since there's only two to three people that have spoken publicly, mm -hmm. I think it's reasonable that staff sit with them and go through each of these items that they've brought up because um, we're not going to be able to address all that today. Right. No, I, I agree. And. Um, that just personally, my my uh, inclination is that there's a lot of stuff in here. It, this is very very complicated, and some of the things that um, are in here, I think, need to be maybe evaluated. I I have a just a couple other questions, just to maybe give you some uh, context of what I, what I'm thinking about. Um, it the the thing that I would have a, a concern about or a question or I think might be worth vetting is. Like, how do these things um, interact with existing state rules or regulations with DEP associated with um, wetland mitigation, uh, wetland impacts, stormwater elements, all of those things? How th There's a lot of information in here, and it, it seems like it would take considerable time to vet those things. So just consistency with the, the rules that are currently being implemented and under which you know, these things might uh, um, be considered. The other thing is um, the, uh, uh, the, th the timeline is, has the, uh, you, you said it's uh, required to be done by a specific date. Has there been any allowance for? Well, that's why, um, that's why we ask, or I ask, that we continue mm -hmm. to September's PC mm -hmm. first, if we're not going to recommend transmittal today, even if it's the revised motion that the public has suggested, mm -hmm. um, because if we do not meet the transmittal of December 1st, um, we will be found inconsistent by the state, non-compliant, and no other plan amendments of any kind, county initiated or applicant initiated, will move forward until this is addressed. Mm -hmm. um, we built in you know, the potential one month delay in case of a storm, because that can always derail a public hearing. Um, but we are tight, and in, in land use public hearing world, we are very tight to meet the December 1st timeline. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but 
a, a specific question. There's been no allowance for extensions. I mean, everything, it seems like the executive orders have allowed extensions of almost every other activity. This isn't one of those activities that. No, and there's been others I've worked with um, last year through the LMS that were not granted one day of an extension. Okay, all right. All right, <coughs> Any anything additional from, from Mr. the Chair? Commission? Uh, Mr. Rutledge, forgot you were there. <laughs> yes, sir. <coughs> Um, I am, I'm, I'm fully cognizant of the need to address the concerns that we have in a timeline that's appropriate. However, when I listen to, uh, Ms. Clark and Mr. Vogel, who I have a lot of respect for, and I think that despite that their position is as representatives or their engagement typically is with developers, I think when you start talking about, um, no repairs to seawalls and these impounds of of costs and the arbitrary nature of all that stuff. I think this is major legislation. I, I, I just, I do not want to go forward. I would love to have the professionals and people we work with all the time. And I, I won't name developers, but uh, Mr. Vogel and Ms. Clark to, to have sat down and walked through this and said, look, I think this is a problem. Now we can disagree, but to not have, a one-on-one -on -one session that might lead to litigation, I, I'm, I'm concerned about that. And I think it's only prudent to say, let's sit down and have those discussions. And I'm not going to vote to move something forward when I hear those kind of concerns and I don't hear an answer other than we have a timeline. So I'm, I'm, I'm always a fan of staff and I know how hard they work, but I don't think moving towards a litigated position at this point makes as much sense as taking a step back and saying, hey, what, what areas specifically? And let's let's talk them through. They sound like they've done a lot of work. When you can count how many changes are in there, they're way ahead of me. And I, I don't want to vote in support of something where someone's done that kind of research and I haven't. So that, that's just my concern. Thank you. Mr. Chair, my only concern with that September 9th continuing state is that we keep this keep in mind, this is a county initiated amendment. Mm -hmm. That means the Board of County Commissioners initiated it. Mm -hmm. And I'm less concerned with staff meeting with private individuals. Staff needs to meet with the board as a whole. Yes, we need board direction. I mean, if they're going to change anything. Right. Once they set the parameters, then it can come back to you. And we can't, I don't see having a board workshop. Well, maybe it's possible before so, September uh, 9th, but I'm just saying <coughs> it may have to be extended again. I don't know. Okay. Um, Ms. Shank, to, to make sure I understand, if um, if it were continued, the board wouldn't have an opportunity to conduct either a workshop or have a hearing where they could provide direction to staff to make changes. Is that correct? Yeah, without the, it probably wouldn't be a public hearing because you haven't had your transmittal thing yet. Right, it would right. probably be a workshop slash special meeting if they want to take make motions on, on issues. Uh, my, my question is, if it's continued through the Planning Commission, can the board uh, uh, modify or, or direct staff to modify? Yes. Okay. And I have to, with the understanding, I have to go back through public hearings again. Okay. Okay. So is it advisable to, um, to keep the timeline that this be continued? That's what I'm I just want to say for the record, I don't know if the board will provide direction before September 9th. Okay. That's all I can say. I'm I have no legal objection with picking that date. It just may have to be continued again. I don't know. Yeah, my, my attempt is to get it in front of the board as quickly as possible so they can vet it because I, I agree uh, it, there's I, I suspect there's going to be changes and that seems to be the quickest way to um, to if we can comply with the timeline even if it is uh, uh, either through continuation or or uh, um, bringing it back as a new agenda item, so um, I guess I'll leave it up to the commission. What, what's the uh, thought here? So you're saying the quickest way to get it to the board is to transmit it or not, or to continue it? I to continue, may, yes ma'am. We need the board to, per what um, Sarah, Mr. Sharashank is saying is we need the board to provide us direction yes. to work with the public. Oh, okay. As opposed to offering a courtesy meeting like we have with others. Well, it's not direction. It's direction on the meat of the policies. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, do they want to prohibit seawalls? I mean, I've never heard them say they did. Right. 
someone needs to do a bullet point of decision points for the board. I don't know if they can read 150 pages on their own, but they might. Right. Some, some will, some won't. Right. Some will like a bullet point. What's being changed? Do you want to make these changes? Yes, no, yes. And they might have to have a special meeting with the work session to take the vote, because it might be a split vote. And then the, it's drafted currently. They're, the, they're my client, so I have to say that they will have the final say on how. Yes, ma'am. So, um, Ms. Knapp, you were, you were saying that um, a continuation to provide an opportunity for the board to provide uh, input would be, whether it be through a workshop, would be preferable? I don't see the workshop happening between now and September 9th. That's probably pretty fair to say, but I don't think continuing it today's hearing to the ninth hurts either and so it gives us time to figure out what's going on and then we can always come back to you on the ninth and request a continuance to no date set. Okay. All right. Okay, I just wonder. Mr. Chairman, can I make a suggestion possibly? Uh, I know it's out. Liberation, Ms. Claude. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, so with that consideration, uh, uh, well, where are we at? We've had public comment. We've had discussion. So I guess we'll close the public hearing part of it and open it up for consideration of a motion. So. Mr. Chair, I move to move this continue item, it. continue this item to September 9th. Okay, we have a motion for meeting. continuance to September 9th. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Roth, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Mr. Aye. Redwood. Okay, thank you. Uh, chair votes aye. The, those opposed, like sign. Uh, no uh, opposition or opposing like uh, indications. So the, the motion passes 5-0 uh, with Mr. Ron and Mr. Smock uh, not present, so thank you. All right, so we're gonna go on to the published agenda and um, the first item on the agenda is the uh, minutes from the January, is this right? January 13th uh, Planning Commission. Thank you, Dan. Let me check the online one. Yep, January 13th, the uh, Commission. So, has that everybody had an opportunity to review the, uh, the minutes from the 13th, January 13th? Any revisions or updates? Okay, uh, hearing nothing, the chair will consider a motion. Mr. Chair, I move to approve the January 13, 2021 minutes. A motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Roth, or, okay, Mr. Roth, second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. Very good. Motion passes 5 0. Uh, the next item on the agenda are. Uh, citizen comments. This is an opportunity to speak on something that is not on today's agenda. Um, if you wish to make a comment or, or make a statement on on something that is on today's agenda, you'll have an, an opportunity when that application is being heard. So with that understanding, is there anybody who wishes to uh, make a comment on something that is not on today's agenda? Anything at all? Okay, seeing no one come forward, we're going to close the public comment, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, citizen comment portion of the hearing, and we're gonna open it up to advertised hearings. Um, we have uh, item number two, which is a uh, presentation upon request, but I have some speaker cards. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and introduce the application. We'll allow the, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, the, the public to come up and make statements and then, then we'll have a longer discussion. So um, just to clarify, the presentation may be uh, a complete presentation or it might be something abbreviated and focus on what the concerns of the, of the citizens would be. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and uh, introduce item number two into the uh, record. Ms. Ms. Lidar. Item number two, PDR 2111CG related to PDR 0617P, the Cove at Terracia Bay Village, the Terracia Land Ventures 1 LLC owner. 
Arizona of more or less 0.63 acres from Agriculture Suburban District A1 to the Planet Development Residential PDR Zoning District on the southeast portion of a 1575-acre site. 15 acres, 0.12 acres are already some PDR and generally located in the Second Avenue East, more or less 600 feet north of 49th Street East between US 19 and US 41 North in Palmero, Manatee County, and approving a general development plan for an additional seven multifamily units with at least 25% of the units designated as affordable housing for a total of 39 multifamily units. Very good, thank you. And uh, for the record, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? No, sir. Mr. Rutledge? No, no sir. Thank you. All right, who do we have for the applicant? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, we need to have everybody sworn in before there's any additional testimony. So if there's anybody who wishes to speak on any application, uh, any quasi-judicial application on this one or any of the others, you need to be uh, sworn in, so please rise. If you don't do it now, you're gonna have to do it when you before you speak. So if you intend to speak, it'd be a good idea to be sworn in. Very good, thank you. And again, uh, who do we have for the applicant? Mr. Schmidt? Mr. Connolly. Yes, um, ma'am. Um, the case uh, manager is Takeya Brown, but she is unable to be here today. Okay. And if there are questions, uh, I'm gonna address the questions. Very good, thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Planning Commission. For the record, my name is Bob Schmidt with Land Planning Associates, and I have been sworn. Thank you. Um, I'll do a, an abbreviated uh, presentation and mm -hmm. then I'm not sure what the concerns are, but we can address that as we move forward. Um, with me today is Kelly Fry. He's the developer of this project. And uh, this, is a, this is actually a project that has um, been there for a while. Um, it was originally called the Palms of Minnesota. And I put the site plan up because you can see that there are several buildings in here that have already been constructed. Um, we do have a valid final site plan for this project to finish out the areas that were not built. The only twist here really is to add this 0.63 acre piece right there. Uh, it is currently zoned A1 and it's gonna become part of the community and it can accommodate up to seven units. Um, again, it, it is a PDR project and, and the concept that we worked on with staff was since it's part of a PDR, why don't you amend the PDR to incorporate this site within it and that's why we're uh, having to talk about the entire area as opposed to just the 0.63 acres. But I want to emphasize that what we really started with here is simply the rezone of that 0.63 acres, and that's, that's really what we're doing. Um, again, I'm going to be very brief. I have reviewed the staff report, and uh, uh, I can give you a little bit more background about where this is, the, the zoning, and so on and so forth. But uh, I think I'll wait till questions come up, and if there's anything that we need to discuss further, we'll go ahead and do that. And I hope that gives the, the Planning Commission enough of an understanding as to what we're trying to do here. Very good. I'll be happy to answer any questions. And, and just uh, maybe one, one additional piece of information for clarification. How many units are being added? Seven. So, the total, so it would be a total of going from 32 to 39. Uh, that's a density of roughly two and a half units per acre on the overall project. Mm -hmm. uh, and just by way of side note, um, many of these existing final site plan areas uh, there, there's construction of some of those units now. They have been spoken for, and the developer has met his obligation for the 25% affordable. Uh, 25 of the seven or 25 of the 39? 25 of the remaining um, uh, houses that, that were never constructed. Uh, I, I'm not sure what that number is. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure what the sales number uh, is. Okay. Uh, it, Twenty five percent of those that didn't get built originally plus the seven that we're asking for. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Uh, so again, to focus on the concerns of the of the uh, um, citizens, we're going to go ahead and call the the folks that I have speaker cards for up and then we'll open it up to anybody else in the audience who wishes to come forward. 
And again, if you could just uh, allow um, staff to, to, to clean the mic a little bit. Sorry, Mr. Heat. What are we doing, staff? Uh, no, okay. Okay. Let's, let's go, it's abbreviated, so let's uh, fo try to focus a presentation upon request. And again, pe presentation upon request is typically, typically those applications that don't have a lot of things that are um, not consistent with code, where there's not a lot of uh, discussion or deliberation typically needed. So uh, the first speaker card I have is David um, Dubauk. Is that even close to the right pronunciation? <laughs> Good morning, and if you could uh, state your name and that you have been sworn. Uh, my name is David Dubowick, and I have been sworn. Thank you. I'm, I'm a little confused because the application we have suggests that they want to rezone about 15 acres. Mm -hmm. But what I'm hearing this morning is it's just a small piece of land on the other side of the road. Is that true? Uh, yes, sir. We'll, we'll again clarify. If you do, raise your concerns and then we'll allow the applicant to provide additional um, okay, uh, discussion. And that's kind of why I wanted to get the citizens up. I think there might be some misunderstanding about the process. So There, there is a piece of land in question that's about 15-odd acres. Mm -hmm. And it's adjacent to the, to the, well, it's right in the area we're talking about. It's mm -hmm. across the street from my house. Yes, sir. It's also a wetland, mm -hmm. and it's a buffer for floods. Right. For that entire area. So it's a wetland, it's a flood buffer, and I have nothing else to say. Very good. We'll, we'll uh, ask the applicant to come up and fo focus very specific on the questions the, the neighbors or the citizens ask to get some clarification. So thank you, sir. Okay. All right. The next speaker card I have is Mary Kamensky. And again, if you could please state your name and that you have been sworn. My name is Mary Kamensky and I have been sworn. Thank you, ma'am. And I'm a resident of the Palms of Minnesota, which has been there probably 20 years. And we've always regarded the wetlands as a, a source of um, environmental protection, not only for us, but also for the live, live wild life that mm -hmm. is present there and suffering now with all the construction because they're being displaced. But I'm more concerned because I hope they won't build on the wetlands. I hope that won't happen because that's part of the zoned area that's shown on the map of the coves. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm concerned about the... Um, the um, number of homes that are going in, it's, it's double what we have now. The Palms of Minnesota a Condo Association and the, the Villas, the Palms of Minnesota, the Villas Association, that's 39 units right there. We have one road that goes in from, nine, uh, from 49th Street all the way in, and it's, a, it's an in-road and an out-road. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be double if he puts 39 more homes in there. Mm -hmm. and, and the zoning for another seven, it still just adds to the problem. So that, that's my concern. And, and also there's nothing written or that I've heard clearly about how that's gonna be dealt with between three associations now. It's the Coves and the Two Palms associations. So we need to do some dialogue about that so it'll be fair for everybody. Because it's right now it's pretty ripped up with all the housing that goes through Second Avenue. That's the access to everything. Very good, thank you. All right, and then the uh, last speaker I speaker card I have is uh, Rodin Monica, or Monica Rodin, I guess, last name, first name. I don't, uh... it, it, you, hold, hold on, let, let uh, staff clean the area. And again, state your name and that you have been sworn, and then you can just say ditto. <laughs> I wasn't sworn in. My name is oh, Monica the, Rodin. If you haven't been sworn in, you have to be sworn in to speak at all. Okay. If, if you... Yep, go ahead. We swear or affirm that the factual statements and factual representations which you are about to present to the Planning Commission will be truthful and accurate. I swear. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just... And, and I'm sorry, could you please state your name? Monica Roden. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I just want to uh, say I agree with the two people in front of me mm -hmm. and what concer concerns me... Uh, with, I know we need affordable living, but it's going to be reduce our 
property value and yeah okay very good thank you all right those were the uh, speaker cards I had for this application is there anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak on this application again if you would come forward state your name and that you have been sworn Good morning, commissioners. My name is Sandra Polera. I'm the president of the Palms of Minnesota Condo Association, which- And, and you have been sworn? Yes, I have been sworn. Thank Very you good. for Thank reminding you. me. Um, our association is like immediately in front of where the development is going to be. Our concern is there is only one road in, which is Second Avenue. Um, which is both the egress and the exit uh, for what is now going to be three associations and two independent houses. Um, the question becomes whether or not um, this can become a county road given the number of associations um, and how the road will be maintained going forward long term. The road now is in pretty terrible shape from the amount of building and development. The second piece that our association is very concerned about is maintaining the integrity of the wetlands that are a significant portion. Um, the project site on the materials that were given showed that it had the wetlands inclusive of the development site. So for our concern, we are very concerned what will be the impact on the wetlands which are in the midst of the development. Thank you. Very good, thank you. And uh, again, if there's anybody else who wishes to come forward, just step forward, state your name and that you have been sworn. You don't have to be recognized, you can just step forward. So. Dan Coppinger, and I have been sworn in. Thank you. I need clarification from the gentleman who's proposing this development, mm -hmm. because he mentions that a prior development was approved, and he mentions it's Palms of Minnesota. That was approved in 1999, and included a clubhouse and a nursing home that was going to go on this property that he's speaking about. When I went on your site, the Planning Commission site, and looked at the maps, the entire 15-acre project that he's planning on developing is wetlands. And it seems particularly ironic that we had a presentation on the need for wetlands. It's actually the largest piece of wetlands in northern Manatee County. But we just heard how imperative it is that we protect our flood zones and, and our wetlands. And this project, it's in its entirety, not 0.6 acres, 0.68 or whatever the number is, but the full 15 acres, when you look on your map, are all wetlands. Thank you. Very good, thank you. Um, again, if there's anybody else who wishes to come forward. Very good. And if you could state your name and that you have been sworn. Uh, Gerald Ronkin, and I have been sworn. Thank you, sir. Uh, I own a home in the Palms of Minnesota Villas, back, back where the uh, new construction is taking place. It's my understanding when this development was first uh, approved, <coughs> there were around 20 individual homes in the front, and then in the back, there were to be something like 38 or 40 homes, attached villas. There was to be a clubhouse. There was to be a uh, um, assisted living, and even a nursing home. This whole community was designed in the 90s 
to serve the needs of gay and lesbian people who were not afforded fair housing all over, and it was a place where uh, they could live in their retirement peacefully, without discrimination. Uh, the front part got built. Half the units in the back were built, the villas. But the development went bankrupt. The swimming pool, the assisted living, uh, and other amenities never got built. And the rest of the homes never got built. It's my understanding that the developer is really finishing what had been approved around the year 2000 or so. Um, nothing different. And it's my understanding that this change that's needed today is needed just to, to complete really what amounts to with the original plans for that area. Thank you. Very good, thank you. And uh, again, if there's anybody else who wishes to come forward and speak on this application, anyone at all. All right, seeing no one else come forward, um, I think we have a, a pretty clear understanding of some of the concerns of the neighbors. I think we would like to focus on those. And, uh, and then after uh, the applicant speaks, we'll go back and see if staff has anything that would be helpful or beneficial to add to it. So Mr. Schmidt, could you? And, and again, if you could uh, uh, state your name and uh, that you have been sworn for the record. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, my name is Kelly Fry, managing member of Terracia Bay Land Ventures One LLC. Mm -hmm. I have been sworn. Thank you. So I'd like to show uh, Bob Scott um, a layout of the community. The history of this community is that. Um, the builder went bankrupt mm -hmm. and didn't finish, mm -hmm. and the land went back to the bank. We're simply building out the homes that were originally planned. Nothing more, nothing less, plus the pool that everybody was promised. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely appreciate all the concerns about wetlands. We would never touch wetlands, nor are we touching wetlands. We are here before you today only with regard to this one piece that the original builder developer planned on being a part of this community, but he went bankrupt before it got added. We are just simply finishing what he started and providing the pool and amenities that were promised to these poor homeowners that were deprived of that for 15 plus years because their builder went bankrupt. Um, in no way, shape, or form are we touching any wetlands whatsoever. In fact, um, we, this is, would be approved for a maximum of seven units. There are only six planned. We are in the process of submitting the FSP for this, and it only shows six units because that's all that could fit so that it would fit attractively and, and blend in with the community. Um, so to the, and with regard to the, the road, Second Avenue, we reached out to both of the boards of both of the existing communities and offered to contribute to their landscaping and contribute to the repair costs of that road, Second Avenue. We've yet to hear back uh, from one of the boards uh, to finalize uh, that contribution, that financial contribution to the maintenance of that road. Um, but I just want to assure the Planning Commission that the wetlands will absolutely be preserved. Everything that we have submitted to the county and staff preserves the wetlands. We are just simply finishing out homes that were promised to these homeowners that were never built because the builder went bankrupt. That is what is happening. We are not touching any wetlands whatsoever. Very good. Very good. Uh, let me ask a couple questions that might add some additional clarification. Um, can you, can you uh, point 
to the area that is being added to this development? O only the area, okay. And can you explain or, or clarify where the new homes are going? There are two triplexes planned for this 0.63 acre parcel. Right. One here and one there. Okay. And, and that's it. And you say there's also a pool that's being constructed? The pool is planned. We haven't submitted those plans right. yet. So it's, uh, it's a work in progress. It's, but we are putting the pool exactly where the original developer had planned it in one of his submittals back in the early 2000s. Right. Isn't it represented on that graphic? Oh, yes, it is. Okay, so that's where the right pool's there. going. Okay. Yes. All right. And the wetland areas, I believe there's one to the lower left and upper right. And do those have a conservation easement on them? Yes, they do. Is that conservation easement in perpetuity? As absolutely, it is. Okay. It so cannot be touched. Can be done. Okay, just, just trying to get on the record for clarification to address the concerns that we heard. So... Um, and with regard to the new units that are going to be proposed, are they going to be under a separate HOA? Um, no, it would be, uh, let me just back up. So there were pad ready, pad, construction ready pads. Mm -hmm. uh, we did update the old FSP. Um, and we improved some of the sewer facilities that had become decrepit b because of being abandoned and not serviced. Those are going right here, two triplexes originally as planned, a couple of duplexes and triplexes exactly as originally as planned mm -hmm. by the original builder. Right. And then this is the reason why we're here, just to rezone this so that it's consistent with the rest of the community and add it to the rest of the community, which is exactly what the original plan was. All right, a again, to help, to help clarify, how many units were in the original um, in the original part of the community? The original density approved was 44. Right. How many are and, being constructed? Um, there there are 20 existing, and we are adding 19. So for a total of 39. Again, to clarify, you said you're adding 19. You're building 19 that were previously approved. We're correct. Okay. Good. We are not exceeding the density. All right. You're, you're building the 19 that were previously approved and adding six. No, the six is included oh, in the included 19. included in the 19, okay. So there were 11 uh, building pads ready for construction mm -hmm. and on the 0.63 acre that we are adding to the community as originally planned, that will have six, so 11 plus, I uh, got the math wrong. <laughs> we're building 12, I'm sorry. No, we're building uh, 13 uh, construction-ready pads plus the six mm -hmm. is 19. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, we already have contract. I got 11 in my brain because uh, we've got 11 that are going into permitting right now. Right. So when all is said and done, how many units will be in the northern part? We are adding the 19 that were never built. Yeah. There's 20 existing, total of 39 39, when all the construction's done, there's going to be 39 homes. Correct. Okay. That's 39 total of existing plus what we are building, 39 total. Very good. I think, I think that helps clarify all the things that I heard that were questions. Um, uh, oh, um, I don't know that you answered. Is, are the six homes going to be a separate HOA, or are they going to be included in the... I'm sorry. No, we, we have formed, because of the legal and financial hurdles of merging the uh, into the old HOA, uh, which those board members are here and have spoken for this mm -hmm. project. The others are not a part of this community. Okay. They're in a separate adjacent community, but not a part of this HOA. Uh, all 19 of the new homes which is the six on the rezone parcel plus the 13 of the pad ready new homes. Those will be in a third HOA. We have entered into and signed and executed and recorded um, a maintenance uh, and cost sharing agreement with the existing HOA. 
and uh, one of those board members is here in support of the project. So uh, I guess kind of the summary is that there's been an attempt to integrate these into the, the existing structures, uh, maintenance structures. Yes, we, we have agreed. It's a recorded public document that we will share vendors and we will share costs and keep the costs low for everybody. Very good. All right, I apologize for over explaining or uh, over questioning for explanation. Oh, I, but, uh, I really appreciate the questions because it illuminates what needed to be discussed because I think there's a lot of misinformation mm -hmm. or misunderstanding in the public simply because, you know, rightfully staff has included the entire project, which does con include conservation areas. And there was the misinformation that those c could potentially be built on or developed, and that's just not the case. Very good, and I, I did think of one additional question. Is the roadway uh, for the community, is that a private roadway? Yes, it is. Who owns it? Um, all, all residences that use that road have recorded ingress, egress, easement rights to it. And the underlying property is owned by? Um, the underlying property in the southern portion is owned by Palms of Minnesota Association, which is 19 single family homes. Mm -hmm. And then the back part of it where we are building is owned by Palms of Minnesota Villa Association, and we have entered into a cost sharing and maintenance agreement with them. Okay, all right, very good. Any additional questions for the applicant? Okay, I think that uh, probably helps. Um, thank you very much. Mr. Rigo, do you, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Leiter's on this one. <laughs> what Thank are you. your thoughts? <laughs> Ms. Leiter, is there anything additional that needs to be From entered? The information provided by the applicant is correct. Mm -hmm. The only is the adding the 0 0.63 acres. Mm -hmm. In the reason, the rest of the area is not subject to any changes of okay. the previous approval. Right, very good, thank you. All right, um, with that, we'll go to uh, staff closing comments. <laughs> Anything further? No, unless you have any specific questions. No. Uh, applicant closing comments? Okay, applicants waving off. Uh, anything additional for the board? All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and open it up for discussion, deliberation, or consideration of a, a motion. Mr. Chair, I move to recommend adoption of Manti County Zoning Ordinance number PDR 21-11ZG related to PDR 0617P, approval of the general development plan with stipulations A1 through A5, B1, C1, and C5, and adoption of findings of specific approval and granting specific approval for alternative to land development code 1007D to allow backing of vehicles onto public or private travel lanes. Very good, we have a motion, is there a second? Second. Mr. Ross, second. Any discussion or deliberation? All right, Chair, we'll call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. Mr. Rutledge. Uh, Chair votes aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, uh, motion passes 5-0 with Mr. Ron and Mr. Uh, Smock not being present. All right, we're up to item number three. Yes. Uh, Ms. Slider, can you please read item number three into the record? Item number three, PDC 0654 PR AP Bradenton Limited Partnership, Royal Park Crossing, Phase 3. Amending and restating Ordinance PDC 0654 P, providing for a rezone of 1.88 more or less acres from the GC General Commercial to the PDC Plan Development Commercial Zoning district and part of a commercial subdivision, lot four, and to approve and revise preliminary site plan in order to create lots 3A and 3B for a total of five commercial lots on 2350.8 acres. The site is generally located in the north side of 53rd Avenue East, State Road 70, south of 51st Avenue East, west of US 301, and east of the 24th Street East, Bradenton, Manatee County. The case is a quasi-judicial. The um, case manager is Mr. James Rigo, and the applicant is Mr. Bob Smith. Sorry for the <laughs> no, speech. No, 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 please. 
I, I treasure that name. Uh, for the record, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, one moment, please. Uh, uh, for the record, have there been any ex parte communications regarding this application? Yes, sir. No. No, sir. Very good. Uh, hearing none, Mr. Uh, Schmidt, could you please Thank introduce you, your Chairman. application? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning again, uh, Planning Commissioners. Uh, this is very similar to the one that you just heard, but it's not residential. Uh, the irony is this is Royal Palm, where the movie theater is at 301 and 53rd Avenue. I'm going to put the site plan up. And it originally it was approved in, I think, 1997. It's very similar to, the, as I said, the project that we just heard. This is a plan development, plan development commercial. Uh, the plan has expired. And therefore, we just want to build out the out parcels that were never constructed on. Uh, the project has a valid certificate of level of service through the extensions. And this approval of the new preliminary site plan will allow the project to be finished, uh, namely, the out parcels 3A and 3B, 2, and lot 4. Lot 4 somehow um, has GC zoning on it, so we're going to change that to PDC to be consistent with the rest of the plaza. It was PDC at one time, got changed to GC, and now we're just going back. Um, the construction of the out parcels is imminent. Um, 3A and 3B already have final site plans and waiting approval of this. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Very good. Any questions for the applicant? Okay. Thank you. Uh, we'll go to staff presentation. Wait, is this a presentation upon request? Yeah, upon request. Uh, I don't have any speaker cards for that. Um, Mr. Rigo, let me open it up for public uh, comment first. And then we'll, we'll go to um, see if there's any need for staff uh, uh, presentation. So um, with that, is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this application? I don't have any speaker cards, but again, we'll open it up to the public. All right, seeing no one come forward, I'm going to close the public comment portion of the, of the hearing and ask the commission, is there anything that we need clarification on? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Uh, Rigo, we're going to waive the uh, staff presentation since Mr. Schmidt uh, did such a fine job explaining it. <laughs> um, so with that, uh, if there's nothing further for the commission, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and open it up for discussion, deliberation, or con consideration of a motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. DeLesline. I made a recommend adoption of the Manti Zoning Ordinance number PDC 0654 PR approval of revised preliminary site plan with stipulations A1 through A2, B1 through B2, C1 through C4, D1 through D10 adoption of findings for specific approval granting specific approval for alternative to land development code 7013A7 to allow alternative to the design of the required side yard landscape and vehicular buffers between lots 3A and 3B. Very good. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Heap, second. Any additional discussion? All right. The chair is going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, like sign. Chair vote tie. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next application we have is the item number five the uh, county initiated comprehensive plan amendment regarding property rights. <coughs> Um, I'm going to introduce the item, yes, Plan Amendment 2102, Ordinance 2126, County Initiated Comprehensive Plan Amendment, creation of a property rights element pursuant to the state statute, state statute legislated. Ms. Lisa Wenzel is the case manager. Hello, um, Lisa Wenzel with staff, and this is a legislative item, so it's not required that I be sworn. Um, but as Ms. Leiter just read in, this is a um, county-initiated comprehensive plan text amendment. This was um, or is a result of the 2021 legislation, which now mandates um, municipalities have within their comprehensive plan a property rights element. So um, it's in your packet and also on the screen. This will add element 13 to the comprehensive plan. It has one objective, one policy with four points and one implementation mechanism. And just um, basically it is to make sure that 
um, property rights are taken into consideration for the local decision-making process. So it's pretty clear. It's exactly what the state language requires. We didn't modify it, so we're just recommending um, your recommendation for board transmittal. Okay, very good. And uh, Ms. Wenzel, to, to be clear, didn't they provide examples of appropriate language? Is that what you were saying? This is exactly this is what? This is the exact language from the state statute. Okay. Not right. modified. Okay, very good. It's pretty uh, cut and dry. It's too bad the other one wasn't that clear. <laughs> <laughs> All right, any, any questions? No, sir. Okay, very good. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and open this up for public comment. Is there anybody in the audience who wishes to come forward and speak on this matter? Anyone at all? All right, seeing no one come forward, we're going to close the public comment portion of the hearing and open it up for uh, discussion, deliberation, or the chair will consider a motion. I'm sorry, uh, I'm going to close the public hearing and open it up for dis discussion, consideration of a motion. Mr. Chair. Mr. DeLesline. I move to recommend transmittal of plan amendment PA 2102. Very good. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Mr. Roth, second. All right. Very good. Um, any additional discussion? All right. The chair is going to call the matter to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed aye. like sign. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Rutledge. Uh, opposed like sign. All right. Chair votes aye. Motion passes 5-0. All right, we're up to item number six. Item number six, uh, I have to recuse myself, so I, I'm gonna, we're going to go ahead and call a 10-minute a break, and then we'll, when we reconvene, Mr. I think Mr. Roth will be the uh, chair, so we're going to go ahead and uh, call a recess. <coughs>
just a nice guy. <laughs> Here we go. Everybody come to order, please. Thank you. You want to read into the minutes? Number six. Give me a second. Item number six, PDR 2016 CG SM Ranch LLC SM Ranch LLC Development Plan. A result of more or less 252.4 acres generally located in the northeast corner of Spences Parish Road and Gulf Coast Road, commonly known as 5300 Spences Parish Road in Parish. From General Development A to the Plan Development Residential PDR Zoning District and approving a General Development Plan for 746 residential units. The case manager is a quasi-judicial case. The case manager is Mr. Uh, James Rigo, and uh, representing the applicant here is Ms. Anne Ritnoir. Uh, any ex parte? No, sir. No. Excellent. No, none. Hi, good morning, Mr. Chair. And um, Ms. Reinauer is going to use the clicker for me, but uh, my name is Michael Neal. I'm here um, as the applicant. Um, so despite the confusing uh, initials, this is the Sybil Musgrave Ranch, not related to Schrader Manatee Ranch, which has been a source of confusion. But we represent um, the land sellers as well, who's uh, the Musgrave family who's owned this ranch for 50 plus years. Um, the siblings are in a position to sell, and this was their mother's uh, riding ranch here in Manatee County for a long time. Anyway, we're here to propose a general development plan for you today. Uh, we have a professional team, um, Anna Reitenauer, a professional planner with Clearview Land Design, uh, Ed Vogler, uh, who's our attorney and, and legal counsel, uh, Chris Fisher, who's an engineer at Clearview, Christopher Hatton at Kimley Horn, um, also an engineer, uh, Joel Christian with Ardura, our environmental scientist, and Richard, uh, Richard Bedford, who's an architect, and, and you may know him, former member of your board, and myself, uh, Michael Neal, is a principal of Wilmington Land Company. Um, we, want, we thank you for the opportunity to present this today. Uh, we've had a long and uh, productive 11 months with your staff um, just for this GDP. So uh, we want to we want to point out today that um, we are seeking the density for a GDP rezone. Uh, we're not seeking obviously any transportation vesting or any any things that don't come with a GDP today. So um, I'm sure you'll hear from members of the public. You'll certainly hear from members of our staff. Uh, we have some ideas about how this property is going to look, um, the homes it's going to provide, and of course um, the ways we're going to mitigate. Uh, any impacts to the surrounding neighborhood. So I look forward to sharing that uh, with you. Thanks. Good morning, my name is Anna Rittenauer. I am a certified land use planner with Clearview Land Design and I have been sworn. Okay, let me introduce to you the SM Ranch General Development Plan application and also for rezone. The area outlined in red is the project limits. The property is located northeast of Golf Course Road and Spencer Parish Road and it's adjacent to rural residential uses to the north east and west. Canoe Creek phase two is adjacent to the south and you can see on the map that this land is bifurcated by an area of wetlands. Here's a map of surrounding concurrency projects in the area. 
This is a really good uh, visual representation of the growth in this area around Golf Course Road and the size of the project relative to others nearby, such as Canoe Creek, Gamble Creek Estates, Twin Rivers, and Rye Ranch. Existing zoning on the property is agriculture. Adjacent to the north, east, and a portion of the west is also agriculture. To the south and west is planned development residential. You can see on the proposed zoning map that the planned development residential is consistent with development pattern in the area. The comprehensive plan states that de development should occur from west to east, and there are already a few other much larger planned developments approved to the east. <clears throat> Subject property and all adjacent properties are within Urban Fringe 3 future land use classification, which allows for up to three residential units per acre. Here is our general development plan with wetland conservation area shown in green. Development is planned to the east and west of this conservation area with a small wetland impact only for access near the southern end of the property. We've planned this impact at the narrowest point of the wetlands. Besides this access connection, the entire wetland area will be conserved. The main points of ingress and egress to the site are from Spencer Par Parish Road to the west and Jim Davis Road to the east. So now I'm gonna go through each of the specific approval requests one by one so that we have an understanding of everything that we're requesting with this general development plan. The first <clears throat> is the optional elimination of buffer plantings in the event that residential homes are not developed within phase one west. Staff interpretation of the land development code would require a landscape buffer to be installed even if phase one west only consists of retention ponds. We believe that installing a buffer in this is instance defeats the purpose of buffer separations because there would be nothing to separate from. So as typical with a general development plan, SM Ranch has not yet been fully engineered once more detail has been evaluated, it may be determined that phase one west is best used for floodplain compensation. If that occurs and no homes are built in this area, we would request that the buffer plantings in the area shown in green would not be installed. If homes are constructed on the west side, the LDC required buffer would be installed. The second specific approval request is to allow a variable roadway buffer width along Jim Davis Road for a minimum of 20 feet and an average of 50 feet. The intent of this code requirement is to provide for a compatible landscape buffer along the roadway to provide separation and protect residents from light, noise, other negative impacts. All required buffer plantings will be installed within the varying buffer width in the area highlighted in green. Allowing for a variable width gives flexibility to our landscape architect to design landscaping that follows the contour of the natural land. Rather than a straight buffer with evenly spaced plants, the varying buffer would appear curvilinear and staggered for a more aesthetic layout. On the right side of the screen, you've, we've shown an example of a typical landscape buffer and an example of a varied buffer width below. The third specific approval is to reduce minimum front yard setback for front loaded garages from 25 feet to 23 feet and reduce the side yard setback from eight feet to five feet. The purpose of rezoning to a PD is to provide flexibility and creativity in development. The reduction that we've proposed is consistent with recently approved PDs in this area and current new home market trends. The reduction will also not have any negative impact on surrounding residential developments. The photo on the screen is a nearby example of a reduced front yard setback. It shows they, there will be no vehicle overhang over the sidewalks. And although there is a reduction in the garage front setback, there's still an opportunity for interruptions of the continuous facade with a recessed garage. The fourth specific approval request is to increase the maximum perimeter buffer wall height from nine feet to up to 20 feet, only in the area indicated on the GDP. The parcel, parcel shown adjacent to the west currently runs a dog kennel, and in order to promote residential compatibility and mitigate noise for new residents, a structurally engineered sound wall 
up to 20 feet tall would be installed with the required buffer plantings on the outside. One point of clarification I wanted to make is that this is not a code required buffer wall and the specific approval would allow for up to 20 feet in maximum height. The actual height of the wall will be determined at the time of final site plan by the developer. This is our, always our intent, but I'm not sure if it was entirely clear in the staff report. <clears throat> we submitted in November 2020, and we've gone through a few rounds of review with staff. We heard from staff last week that they were not in support of this height. So um, we wanted to proffer the following stipulation. We've sent this to staff, and I just wanted to read it onto the record. The buffer wall adjacent to the parcel to the west of the project may be constructed to a maximum of 20 feet tall with required buffered landscaping to be installed on the exterior side of the wall. Actual height of the buffer wall will be determined by the developer at time of final site plan. The fifth specific approval and final is to allow travel lane pavement width to be reduced from 12 feet to 10 feet wide. Complete streets roadway section T22 from the Manatee County Public Works Manual will be provided as shown on the cross section on your screen. In order to propose complete streets, there's a set of criteria required. We've provided description of how we believe that we follow each criterion within the application and hope that the implementation of complete streets will be encouraged with this development and future. Providing reduced travel lanes within the typical right-of-way width is a great opportunity for public benefit and the best quality of life for the new community's residents. Providing reduced travel lanes also not only gives more opportunity for streetscape, but it also provides a traffic calming solution on all local roads and provides more space for public utilities within the right-of-way. We did receive staff's uh, updated agenda memo with analysis of complete streets yesterday afternoon and we understand there are still some concerns. We've, we've done our best to um, work with staff and we would like to continue to mitigate those concerns. So as part of that, I did wanna proffer this, um, another stipulation. We again have sent this to staff um, and so I just wanna enter it into the record the Homeowners Association or Community Development District rules and regulations shall preclude on-street parking and the responsible entity shall provide for the enforcement thereof in accordance with their respective rules and regulations and applicable law. So I think now Ed Vogler is gonna talk a little bit about policy related to that. <clears throat> Good morning, commissioners. My name is Ed Vogler. I have been sworn. And we don't like to have these uh, disagreements with your professional staff because we have the greatest respect for them and, and the workload that they're under. And I just want to emphasize that. Uh, however, you're a policy-making board. And you get to analyze the policy questions. And as it relates to the complete streets question, I'd like to speak to that for just a moment. Complete streets are a concept that is becoming a modern lifestyle design. There is a full design section of the Manatee County Roadway Design Manual that speaks to complete streets, both their design and their utility and why they might be beneficial in Manatee County. It's not been used often, but we do have a project in our North River Ranch community that has complete streets approved, and we're proceeding with that now. It's really just in the same general vicinity of this project. This is good policy though, because in a private road or a non-county community development district road, you'll have a more open community. You'll have less impervious surface and you'll have slower speeds on roadways. And these are some of the design elements that support consideration of complete streets and why you actually have it in your design manual. So when you come forward with a planned development residential community, we want to give a superior alternative and we believe this to be a superior alternative. 
and we've discussed this with the fire marshal and have contain, uh, obtained conditional approval of the concept, one of the concerns is parking on the streets. Well, I understand that, but we have, we don't allow parking on any of our streets, right? So we're talking about non-county streets. If you dedicate them to the county, the homeowners association or the CDD cannot enforce that. That becomes a county responsibility. However, in a private community or a CDD public community, we can enforce those, and we do. We place them in the deed restrictions or the rules and regulations of the community development district, and those are enforceable. Now, someone suggested that, well, you could change that. But I want to remind you and everyone, we solve a lot of the issues in our land development questions by a notice to buyer. Does everybody recall notice to buyers? We do those all the time, and they're required by stipulation and we put them into our homeowners' documents. And in theory, every time you require a notice to buyer as solving a problem, the same comment can be made. Well, that can be changed. Well, of course it can be. But it isn't because it becomes a project stipulation as well. So now you have a code compliance consideration. So I think that is not a good reason to be against um, complete streets in this case. So we will prohibit the parking in the roadways like we do in all of our communities. The question of guest parking is something that we have proffered. We're planning to have guest parking around the community that can alleviate any further desire or encouragement to have on-street parking, which is not going to be permitted. So we've presented to you a stipulation relative to the Homeowners Association or CDD rules. This should be sufficient. As it relates to the wall, um, you know, walls are often requested by neighbors when, when a new development is coming forward. This is a little bit the reverse, and we certainly are respectful for design and aesthetic considerations and would work with your staff in that regard. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I had one comment on that proposed stipulation that Mr. Vogler just read. The county doesn't regulate what goes in HOA or CDD rules. I would prefer to say that notice to buyers include that restriction on parking on private streets, if, if that's acceptable. Okay. Let's have um, staff presentation. Morning, Planning Commissioners. Jim Rigo with staff, and I have been sworn. Uh, there is an update to uh, specific approval request number two, which I'll pass out to you right now. Thank you. Again, good morning, uh, Jim Rigo with staff and um, Natalie. I think they did an excellent uh, presentation on the locational criteria. We can skip forward to slide three. We'll just go over the request to begin with. This request rezones 252.4 acres from A to PDR to allow the development of the property with uh, 746 dwelling units and associated infrastructure. General development plans don't require design intent, but the plan does include locations of SM Ranch's access points, as well as depictions of the lot layouts, showing the general design and minimum setbacks for two of the three lot types, single family detached, single family attached, and single family semi-detached. Um, as Anna mentioned, there are five requests for specific approval to provide design alternatives to those regulated in the LDC. 
And next, please, we went over the future land use. We are in the urban fringe, three dwelling units per acre, and uh, those are uh, generally used for low-density residential, short-term ag, medium-density clustered residential neighborhood, and community commercial, public, semi-public recreation and schools. Next, please, just to review the zoning, it is general agriculture. And the overlay district is the north central overlay, which uh, has a little, a couple extra design elements for buffering and landscaping. Uh, this is the GDP. Um, the density uh, figure would be 757 at three units per acre. Uh, the, the applicant has appropriately uh, used the wetland transfer calculation and that's how they arrive at the 746 units. The open space is 25% and uh, that 67 acres that they're providing is uh, equates to about 26.6% uh, of the property. Now, the building height they're proposing, uh, the maximum is two stories, they're proposing one and two story units. And the access, there's a main access point to Jim Davis Road and two secondary access points to Spencer Parish Road. Uh, Anna mentioned the cross access that's through the wetlands that's uh, minimal impact to that area. Next, please. Of the 252 acres, um, 54 is uh, considered wetlands. Like I said, they have impacted uh, 0.45 acres. Uh, the buffers, uh, <laughs> The perimeter buffers at 20 foot are compliant, and um, they have requested specific approvals on the roadway buffers to be um, be varied. Next, please. And this just gives you an idea of uh, stormwater facilities, which are next on that list. Uh, they are in the blue areas adjacent to the wetlands, and there are a couple of, there's one outlier at Jim Davis Road. Um, the utilities, potable water, there's an existing eight inch water main on the east side of Jim Davis Road and the 12 inch water main is stubbed out along the north side of Golf Course Road. There's an existing 12 inch force main along the north side of Golf Course Road. And I believe there's a master plan for the county that uh, calls for an eight inch force main at Golf Course Road, which has yet to be constructed. Uh, reclaimed water exists uh, in a 30-inch main along the south side of Golf Course Road, and there's a four-inch uh, four existing stub out at the southwest corner of the site. Next, please. This slide shows the products, lot types, uh, and the size information. The types of units are single-family detached, single-family attached, and single-family semi-detached. Uh, those are commonly known as obviously single family lots, townhomes, and villa duplex. Um, we provided the information uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, in the request for specific approval. They are requesting reduction of front setbacks and side setbacks. There you see the details of two of the three lot types the single family lot detail, those are 40 foot wide lots. And then we have the villa lot detail, and uh, those are proposed for 35 foot wide with the shared wall. The um, no detail was provided for the uh, single family, uh, single family attached, but it's uh, three units or greater uh, townhome. Uh, next is the nearby approvals and the development info. The predominant transition pattern for this area has been from A to PDR. There you see three nearby uh, developments, Gamble Creek Estates, Canoe Creek, and the aviary at uh, Rutland Ranch. And, um, these developments fall uh, between uh, two units per acre and three, so um, the development density of 2.95 units per acre is consistent with the the other developments approved over the last decade. Next, we'll go over the five specific approvals. The applicant has requested specific approval for alternative designs to the land development code sections and the public works design manual requirements. 
Those sections listed in green have been supported by staff and those in red have not. The first is to eliminate the green belt buffer and tree planting requirements for the area adjacent to future residential phase within the project area if residential development does not occur. Uh, the second, uh, which limits heights of fences, berms, or combination of the two to nine feet. The applicant is proposing a fence or wall 20 foot in height along the proposed uh, along the property line where the project abuts a dog kennel for a distance of approximately 1,382 feet. The next is reducing the roadway buffers from 50 to as little as 20 foot to accommodate the right of way with a 50 foot average width overall. The fourth is to allow a travel lane pavement width to be reduced from 12 to 10 feet in width. And the last is to allow for a two foot reduction in the front setback from 25 feet as required by code to 23 and a three foot reduction to the side yards from eight to five foot. The following three requests for specific approval are supported by staff. Staff is in support of the request to waive the requirement of having a roadway and green belt buffer if no residential development will be constructed within phase one west. Staff has found that the purpose of the land development code regulation is satisfied to an equivalent degree by the proposed design because the site has a large wetland conservation area within phase one east that will provide adequate screening and buffering. If no residential development is proposed within phase one west, there is no need to screen using the roadway and greenbelt buffer. Next, staff is in support of the request to reduce the roadway buffers along age adjacent thoroughfare roads from 50 to as little as 20 foot to accommodate right-of-way with a 50-foot average width overall. Staff has found that the purpose of the Land Development Code regulation is satisfied to an equivalent degree by the proposed design because the site will have a minimum of 20-foot wide buffers with code required plannings with an average of 20-foot wide throughout, allowing buffers to be wider in some areas to compensate. And the last supported uh, request for spe specific approval, staff is in support of the request to waive the minimum front yard setback requirement of 25 foot to allow for a two foot reduction to 23 foot and the three foot reduction to the side yard setback from eight to five foot as the reductions will not have any impact on the surrounding residential communities. Stipulation A3 in the staff report states that the distance from the sidewalk to the garage will be 25 foot for front loaded units. And next, please. The two not supported by staff. Staff is not in support of the request to allow travel lane width pavement uh, to be reduced from 12 to 10 foot. The pavement width may only be reduced if there's extenuating circumstances and if deemed allowable by the public works director or the county engineer. The other option is to provide a complete streets program with specific design consideration available in the Public Works Standards Manual, and we've just received that within the last uh, couple weeks. No design consideration have been presented by the applicant to address how the development will provide for guest parking or residents that have more than two cars per family. It is staff's opinion that the ability to review for compliance with this section cannot be accomplished in this GDP. At minimum, the presentation of a preliminary site plan along with complete streets program analysis should be submitted for staff review. And the second uh, not supported is staff is not support of the request to allow the installation of a 20 foot wall, 11 foot higher, which is 122% than the maximum of nine foot to provide additional buffering and noise attenuation for the adjacent kennel use property. Per LDC 531.47, residential development shall not be located within 75 foot of existing kennels. And there has been no detail provided to address this section for compliance for setback or noise attenuation. Additionally, with this general plan, staff has not had the ability to properly, properly analyze the aesthetic impact the structure would have on the surrounding properties or evaluate the accompanying landscape buffer. Next, next please. Positive, is, uh, positive aspects, I'm sorry, the development is a logical expansion of the existing PDR zoned communities of Canoe Creek and Twin Rivers to the south and Gamble Creek estates to the west. And the project proposed 
The project's proposed in a location with the existing and available public utilities and services as there are existing residential communities in this area. Next is the negative aspects. The site abuts a large two to 10 acre residential parcel zoned agriculture on the north, east, and portions of the west side of the proposed development. And no specific design layout has been provided with the general development plan to evaluate the project for compliance with section 402.6.F of the land development code for superior design. In conclusion, aside from the aforementioned con concerns, the request appears to be consistent with the comp plan and in compliance with the LDC. It's the end of my presentation. I'll stand close for questions and rebuttal. Thank you. Questions of the applicant. I'm sorry, questions of the staff. None. Questions of the applicant. None. No, sir, not right now. We're not asked to rebut anything you all said. No, I'm going to rebut. You are going to rebut. Now's the time. After public comment. After public comments, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll get it straight eventually. I have three public comments. Brenda Bagley. Hi, my name is Brenda Bagley, and I have been sworn. Um, well, I live on Jim Davis Road, pretty much like right directly across the street in the middle of the property of what they're going to do here. You know, so it's definitely affecting, you know, us and the reasons that we moved out there for, you know, especially seeing the um, skinny cows that have never been skinny prior to um, the person who purchased them. I had to mention that because it, I see them all the time. Um, let's see, where do I start? Um, I'm not used to public speaking, so bear with me. My heart's pounding. <laughs> if you um, speak a little, close, a little closer to the microphone, yeah, that would be helpful yeah. and take your time. Yeah. We were wondering, though, I mean, it, it came to our, um, uh, well, we just discovered that none of the commissioners are actually here. So we were kind of concerned about that. I mean, you know, no offense to you people that, you know, aren't commissioners, but we just thought that we would be speaking to them. Um, so I guess the big thing is, uh, well, I don't know if anybody's really paid much attention, but Jim Davis Road is a very skinny road. We have a one-lane bridge, and on both sides of that bridge, it's one lane. So we are really curious about how all of this is going to impact our road. There's one way in and out of if it's flooded, which Jim Davis Road Bridge does flood, and so does Golf Course Frit Bridge, it floods also when we get tons of rain, which I don't think that you know anybody's really seen that yet. Myself, I've been out there 25 years, and my neighbors over here have been the same amount of time and, and longer. And so, yeah, we've seen a lot of flooding out there. So, well, you know, we're concerned about that. And we're also kind of concerned about the fact that it, Maybe I don't understand all of this, some of it, um, but are you trying to change the way that the floodplain flows now? It looked like that, and I hadn't really heard anybody mention anything about that. Um, and, well, I feel confident that if, if everyone on Jim Davis Road and Spencer Parish Road were to have received all of this, there'd be more people here, for sure, <laughs> for sure, because... I wasn't aware of a lot of this in here. So, and then I, I do want to mention uh, Cindy Humphrey's property on Spencer Parish Road because she's lived there for 43 years. She couldn't be here today. Um, yeah, and she's lived there all that time. And so to, to visualize building this wall up around her property uh, is like putting her in a prison. I mean, what, you know, how aesthetic is that for her? I mean, you've talked about making it all pretty on the other side of the fence, but what about her? She's got all these beautiful, you know, oak trees that, you know, if you, none of these pictures really justify what it looks like out there. And so, yeah. And then another thing is I'm pretty sure no one uh, approached her to try to buy her property, and I know that because she's told me that. No, not the person that it would, you know, 
would need to, the person that would want to buy it has never approached her. And she may may do that, you know, because, yeah, she is like the worst. She's got the worst end of the stick on any of this. So I know it beeped. So I apologize and thank you. Thank you for your time. Kathleen Sujit, is that the correct pronunciation? No, Kath. Okay, thank you. And how about Lacey White? Hi, I'm Lucy White. I also live on Jim Davis Road. And let me tell you, you can put up a wall 100 feet and it's not going to stop you from hearing those dogs. I live on Jim Davis. I hear the dogs all the time. It doesn't bother me. I live in the country. That's why we moved out here. How are you going to put all those cars down our road? It floods out. The people that live on our road, that live right on the road, when the rain is coming, I stop they you for park. A second? What? Have you been sworn? Yes. Go ahead. People park on Jim Davis Road when we know we have a big storm coming, like this weekend, because their road is, their homes are below that road and they can't get out. Also, I'm halfway down the road from my house to 675, goes underwater. How is this going to affect me? I've had water in my house. What about the schools? I'm raising two grandkids to go to Williams. They already have two portables. Does anybody care that we don't have the schools? to put all these people? You, we moved out here because we like being in the country. You are trashing this. If it's agriculture, leave it be agriculture. This could have been nice. It's five and 10 acre ranches, something like Foxbrook, or the place down in Sarasota, Saddle Creek. That's a wonderful community. This is not go with where we live and how we live. Brenda and I have horses. We used to ride all the way down Fort Hamer Road. Now, we can't hardly go down our road without getting run over. You bring all these people out, it brings crime. Right now, I don't have to lock my doors. I'll be getting a lock and a bigger dog in my yard. This does not go along with anything. No one has considered what we have to deal with. And you have these meetings in the morning where the working people can't come. That's why they're not here. Have any of you gone out and looked at this place? Has any one of you thought how it's going to affect the people that already live here? Not, none of you. We have flooding all the time, and this is going to make it worse. Our road's going to turn into a freeway. Kids can ride their bikes up and down the road. Now they won't be able to. We will not be safe. What about the fire department? We don't have enough fire departments now. Wake up, people. This is too many homes, and it's not fair to the people who have lived out in Parish for years and years and years. You're comparing it to other developments. You don't take any concern for the people who live in the country, who like to live in the country. If I want to walk out to the barn in the morning in my nightgown, I can do that. You get all these people in, nobody can do anything. It's just not what we moved out here for. And poor Brenda, she's right across from the opening now. It's just not right. You need to think about the people that live here already and how it's going to affect us. I've seen kids dropped off from the bus on 675 in two feet of water to walk down the road. That's what the bus drivers do. They leave those kids walk down. The road goes underwater. The, road, the, the bridge on golf course goes underwater. Brenda has water, runs out of that pasture down into her yard. Wake up. Think about somebody besides the developers. Mr. Vogler? Hold on one second. Are there any other further comments from the public? Go ahead. Mr. Vogler? Yes, sir. Thank you. We, we appreciate those comments, and we'll make just a few um, rebuttal explanations. If you, if you look at this drawing, you'll, you'll see that the, the access point off of Jim Davis Road is in the southeast corner of the property. I gave him the opportunity. No, that was 
was before the public comment. Go ahead. Sorry. All right. You, you notice that the, the connection on Jim Davis Road is in the southeast corner of the property, and it is, it is oriented that way so, so that the, the considerations for Jim Davis Road that she mentioned are not going to be in play because the access is so close to Golf Course Road, and that area will be improved significantly for access. We've already built a revised and, and realigned Jim Davis Road uh, through that area. And so also access will be provided on Spencer Paris. So we're, we're sensitive to the point that Jim Davis Road is a, a rural road and it will remain that even after this project is approved. We asked and we discussed about the wall and we hope that you'll get, grant us that flexibility. Um, the, the nice lady testified that she could hear the dogs um, from a long way away and, and we understand that and that's why we've asked for this flexibility from the board. You know, as it relates to travel lanes, as it relates to travel lanes, there's um, a project manual that was discussed and the staff understands it and we understand it. And, and we, we want to work with the staff. We want to bring forward and show them whatever type of design are necessary to, to support this concept. But we need your support today on this concept. In, in our villages in Sarasota County, we, we haven't built a 12-foot wide uh, travel lane since 2010. And while the staff report says that the staff would under no circumstance support anything less than 11, so 11 is not 12 and it's not 10, and it's, it's the type of thing that really you would have to say that a complete streets program that allows for the 10-foot travel rain, lane has a lot of modern benefits, and that's why we're bringing this forward. Uh, we totally respect the idea that our notice to buyer would include a stipulation on no on-street parking in the event that the complete streets program was brought forward, and, and we certainly support that as well as the other stipulations that, that we've made. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask our project engineer to speak briefly about flooding. Uh, everyone is concerned about flooding all the time, but there are lots and lots of rules, and I think you know that and have heard this many, many times. Uh, Chris Fisher with Clearview Land Design, and I have been sworn. So when we're going through the final design process of, of a, uh, this particular project, we will look at the floodplain of the area as a whole and do a volumetric analysis of how much water is actually being uh, uh, going to the site from a pre-development perspective. And we, we're not allowed to raise the stages of any of the, the um, nodes that are uh, adjacent to and in surrounding the area. So from a, a flooding perspective, uh, we're not allowed to make it any worse than it is out there today. And we're going to try to do our best to, to help uh, the surrounding community when we're doing our, our final design. But again, this is too early at this stage to, to show anything to this board. But again, the, the rules that are in place do not allow us to make it any worse than it is out there today. In closing, Mr. Chairman, we would appreciate your support of this project today, and we would encourage you to make the approval motion that is identified on page five of the update memorandum. There's an approval motion. And however you deliberate on these questions, we would be very grateful for your statements of support of the concept and policies associated with complete streets. This should become something that's important to Manatee County. It's important to our project, and we'd like you to consider that as we move forward in the deliberations today. Thank you. Discussion amongst the uh, planning commission. No, staff is next. Yeah, but we never did the staff closing. Yeah. Well, could we have a uh, Manatee County staff talk about flooding? Staff, you want to talk about flooding? Is he here? Tom is here. Thank you. Yeah, I see it. 
For the record, Thomas Gersenberger, Public Works Department, and I have been sworn. Um, first, let me start off with little perspective since we've already broached the subject during public comment and prior testimony with respect to this general area and flooding. So let me start with, first off, all the pictures I'm presenting into evidence are from Hurricane Irma back in 2017. <clears throat> this first picture is of the bridge at Golf Course Road and Gamble Creek. Can we hear me? All right. I'm going to continue. Uh, next series of pictures are on Jim Davis Road itself. Um, these pictures, with respect to what was just brought up from the applicant about the proposed location of the entrance into the development, this would be north of that particular entrance location. I'll actually go over that point in more detail with an aerial. So there's picture number one of Jim Davis Road. This is picture number two of Jim Davis Road up closer to the one lane, one lane with road bridge. The, the bridge itself, the roadway itself narrows down to the bridge over Gamble Creek, which only allows traffic to travel through that bridge in only one direction. It's not a two lane bridge, it's only a single lane bridge. And then once we get down to, and this is, is actually looking at um, 675, County Road 675, um, on up near the uh, intersection of Jim Davis Road itself. So you can see the, the fl flooding and the inundation that is overspreading out onto the southbound or eastbound uh, lane of the roadway of County Road 675. And now these next couple pictures, this particular picture is looking from uh, County Road 675 looking south back towards the bridge on Jim Davis Road and then let's do one more is at the intersection of Jim Davis Road and 675 itself. Now let me point out a couple of things because I actually have this written, I actually have this in a tabular format as well. Hurricane Irma back in 2017 was actually there have been much greater events than from Hurricane Irma. Um, if we date back to 1992, there was actually a tropical depression. I know it's kind of seems relevant given what might happen this weekend, that a tropical depression caused more extensive flooding than what occurred during Hurricane Irma uh, back in 2017. Um, also from 2001, uh, we had tropical storm Gabrielle. So both Tropical Storm Gabrielle in 2001 and Tropical Depression Number 1 back in 90, 1992 caused more extensive flooding than what these pictures from Hurricane Irma illustrate. Now let me go through. Thank you. If we, yep, good. If I point to the southeast corner of the project, and the proposed location of the entrance, the proposed entrance of the entrance to this project from Jim Davis Road itself. And as the applicant pointed out, and unfortunately I flipped it on this particular aerial, but just you'll get the general premise of it. Jim Davis Road itself, um, prior to the Canoe Creek development, went straight south to an intersection with Golf Course Road. Um, with the construction of Canoe Creek, uh, Jim Davis Road was realigned. Um, it is a, an improved roadway section. Um, I'm pretty certain it does. I imagine the applicant could confirm this with me as well, that that particular section, Jim Davis Road, was brought up to county standards, 24 feet pavement, 12 feet travel lanes. Um, drainage was provided, floodplain mitigation was provided for any impacts within and the 100-year floodplain. And last, let's go over the 100-year floodplain. <clears throat> um, if I can have that zoomed out just a little bit further, please. Yep, thank you. Okay, first off, it is no longer proposed FEMA 2021 firm. It is effective as of August 10th, 21, 2021, uh, effective flood insurance rate map. So what you see on this map, and yes, as I love to eloquently note it as the sea of red map, this is an effective 
see a red map. This is, if you go to an insurance agent today, he will be utilizing this floodplain delineation as not only best available information, but effective information through FEMA. So as you can see, the project outline that's shown in yellow on this particular exhibit. And one other point to make is that the floodplain delineation that was most recently updated on the firm incorporates the Gimble Creek Watershed Management Plan that is a joint study between the county and Southwest Florida Water Management District so that the best available information from that floodplain, from that watershed management plan has now been incorporated into our flood insurance rate maps. Um, as the applicant pointed out, and, and, and certainly we've been coordinating with the applicant with respect to this project, just given the nature of flooding in this general area, um, there are a number of uh, stormwater stipulations in the staff report, uh, which requires the applicant to address floodplain mitigation for flood impact, for impacts within the 100 year floodplain delineation, uh, to reduce their post development allowable rate of runoff by 50% for Gamble Creek watershed, <clears throat> excuse me, and to run a series of uh, storm event modeling for a variety of different storm frequency events. Um, the most commonplace storm, storm water events that we're used to hearing about at Planning Commission at the border, the 25 year storm event and the 100 year storm event which respectively those equate to eight inches and 10, 10 inches of rainfall within a 24 hour period. But just as a final note, certainly it, it doesn't, we're looking at flooding that is experienced in this area that happens prior to or even well before we would reach like an eight inch accumulation or a 10 inch accumulation um, that are usually designed to for a 25 year, 100 year storm event. Uh, typically flooding, Countywide, and just to give a just a, from a perspective, typically county staff we, we start to look for um, as far as hotspots, the areas that we know and are, are prone to flooding. We start to uh, we're, our concerns about flooding start typically around four inches of rainfall accumulation within a day or a particular storm event. So anything above four inches in that in that time frame that I just mentioned is when staff starts to inspect our drainage systems and our hotspots for flooding. Now at this time, I'll be happy to address any further questions that the Planning Commission has. Is there any future projects that will eliminate some of the flooding for the existing residents planned? <clears throat> for Gamble Creek, uh, there are none that are planned within the present five years capital improvement project, no. There are, there are a number of projects. Um, actually, the most recent project um, within this journal area uh, was a, a project, a drainage improvement project that occurred on County Road 675 up uh, further up, excuse me, not up, down, further down the road on 675 towards Rye Road and along the opposite side from Foxbrook. There was a drainage improvement project in that area. Um, I know that we have a couple other improvement projects that we're looking at as far as culvert replacements. Um, there's also long range plans as far as Mulholland Road, as far as a bridge crossing there, things of that sort. Tom, based on the modifications that will be going along, based on what's supposed to happen, will that alleviate any of the flooding that you currently see? that you just showed us other than hurricanes. Mr. Roth, are you referring to this development itself or? Are you yes, the development itself. With respect to the development itself, when we, uh, as far as the final site plan or construction plan application or even an environmental resource permit through Southwest Florida and Water Management District, the applicant is required to demonstrate that this project creates no adverse drainage impacts to surrounding areas. So as the applicant brought up, um, there can be no increases in flood stages uh, attributed by development of this property um, for the series of storm events that I was referring to. So whether it's for a 25 year, 100 year storm event or other series of storm events that are, are included in the stipulation language, the applicant is required to go through those series of storm events with drainage modeling, incorporating the Gamble Creek Watershed Management Plan to demonstrate that there is no even if it's a hundredth of a foot, that there's no increases in stages. Okay. 
Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, just to kind of dumb that down for us laymen, um, currently there's, there's no control on the site for the water that runs off, correct? That is correct, sir. And then yes. once they do development, they will have to retain water for a certain period of time that would then control that runoff that's currently not in, under control. That is absolutely correct, yes. That, I think there was actually an exhibit that was brought up uh, during the testimony about proposed location of stormwater facilities. So those stormwater facilities would provide water quality treatment and attenuation of the on-site runoff and then combined with the floodplain mitigation areas that would be provided to address uh, floodplain uh, on-site on floodplain impacts. Right, so, so if they affect the current floodplain by raising elevations for home sites, they would have to mitigate that on their site as well, they, which so it would not impact the neighbors. That is correct. Thank that you. is correct, Mr. Heap. Any other questions for Tom? No? Okay. Just make sure there's none for Mr. Roy Village. <laughs> If he's still on. Um, I was just going to say, <laughs> we get away. Uh, first of all, uh, Thomas, I, 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 I do enjoy when you come forward and present because I feel I really know what's going on. I, I kind of go back to the simple thing that we always talk about. You're going to make it better, not worse, by beating the contemporary codes. And I, I empathize very much with a woman who is frustrated about transition and you know, what it was and what it's going to be and all that. And having grown up in South Florida when there was nobody else there, I get it. Um, however, I do think a couple of things. I do think that the water issue is a primary concern for me because that is a uh, community and statewide concern. I, I think we take it somewhat for granted. And the new standards, I'm not afraid of what level we get to to make them as pristine as possible. So I, I feel very high confidence that that not having a bunch of requests relating to the water is good. I do have something that kind of relates to that, and that is the green space versus uh, the required amount of green space that they're going to provide, because it seems like with that kind of uh, drainage conditions, the open space is going to be pretty significant to maintain that water runoff control. Is that a true statement? Uh, Mr. Rutledge, uh, first off, good morning, sir. And secondly, yes, I would agree with you that there will be substantial open space within this project limits just dedicated to stormwater management and to floodplain mitigation areas. Um, but certainly, uh, Mr. Rigo and, and uh, could also elaborate further on the, on the um, design and the proposed open space area. But yes, certainly open space uh, when we look at open space associated with any development, a good portion of it, especially in a flood prone area like this, is, uh, is specifically from stormwater facilities or floodplain mitigation area that are, are dedicated in conjunction with the design of such stormwater facilities for the project. And, and the other follow up to that is that the difference of having this submitted to us uh, this month versus last month is a very significant change in what the requirements are because of the 100-year flood and the FEMA mapping. Is that true? Mr. Rutledge, yes, that is, uh, I would say that is correct, but given the fact that with respect to Gamble Creek Watershed Management Plan, staff and as far as the Southwest Florida Water Management District have already been utilizing the floodplain delineation associated with the Watershed Management Plan as best available information. However, now we have an extra layer of if, what, are, what you may want to call it, whether it's confirmation or validity, considering now it's gone an extra step and has now been incorporated through a map amendment into the FEMA flood insurance rate maps. But certainly, the additional, you know, like I brought up, now for a flood insurance agent, anyone of that sort to go pull up a flood insurance rate map, First off, they're going to pull up their August 10th, 2021 latest effective firm panel that will uh, illustrate the 100-year floodplain delineation from the watershed management plan. Great. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. You're welcome, sir, as always. <laughs> they have closing comments. Uh, Did you have Mr. Question? Chair, could we also have uh, traffic and maybe Thanks. talk about the... Okay, let's do streets. traffic.
for the record on Nelson Galeano Transportation Planning. Um, let me start um, my statement indicating that uh, the traffic impact statement has been approved and the county concur with the results uh, of the traffic impact statement. Uh, our current regulation focuses essentially on auto-oriented uh, development. Um, the level of service, which is uh, the performance measures, uh, regulates essentially in the way we move here in Manatee County. The traffic impact statement uh, provided by the consultant is silent uh, regarding mobility. And let me explain a little bit about mobility in regard to complete streets. There are here unfortunate, unfortunate uh, misunderstanding about complete streets. Com and complete streets um, has to do with three main topics. The first one is, is uh, complete street is for all users, uh, all ages and abilities. Complete streets uh, has a lot to do with uh, context sensitive solutions, co with context classification, with the land use. And I will back uh, to the topic land use. And complete street has a lot to do with safety, quality of life, economic development, and sustainability. Complete street allows a clear transition from auto-oriented development to multimodal, no, to auto-oriented travel to multimodal travel. Auto-oriented travel uh, always uh, chose uh, few accesses, a lot of cul-de-sacs. Uh, multimodal travel chose, on contrary, high connectivity, high accessibility, and, and the possibility to perform short trips, short distance and local trips. And I come back to the fact that uh, complete street has to do with context uh, uh, sensitive uh, solutions and context classification. What that mean is uh, short trips are only feasible when we, when we have the land use diversity. In this case, we don't have land use diversity, and in this case, there are no short trips. There are the, 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 the distance, the length of the trips are longer. Uh, and that is one of the things that the, uh, I say this is a misfortune in the way we understand complete streets. Uh, we believe that a uh, complete street for, in this case, is not fully applicable, essentially because we have a mono-use uh, development. I want to emphasize also uh, that complete streets, uh, and I want to quote, sorry, I want to quote uh, the president of the Florida chapter of the Institute of Transportation Engineers, uh, Mr. Bichat Kakat, our county, traffic engineer, he said, every complete street project will not be a multimodal boulevard. With all pedestrians, build out bells and landscape medians whistles. It means, uh, and I see for clarification, uh, our US 301 is a complete street. Why? Because it meets the purpose. Uh, it is for the user, Land, long trips, high speeds. Uh, this is the relationship between the land use and the facility. And the US 301 is a complete street because it meets the purpose. When, um, and the last, the, the, the other topic is the design controls uh, on complete streets. We speak about, um, we handle with the speed, with design speed, with the design vehicles. Uh, it means uh, fire trucks, garbage trucks, uh, with the design hour, we design for the PM peak hour, uh, we design for the for the for the peak year. It means in 2000 for 2045, 2050, uh, and we use performance measures on complete streets. And performance measures in this case, uh, uh, we we want to use the number of taxes, the size of the blocks. 
and the number of cul-de-sacs. We the provide the information, uh, as mentioned by Mr. Rigo, um, we cannot say what type of design we have. Is it superior or not? Because it is unknown. Um, the only thing that we know is that we have three access for about 750 daily units. Um, before the auto era, uh, the design was integral, was complete, because uh, um, the design was done for all ages and abilities. Um, complete string is a modern term in the way we designed roads 60 years ago. Um, when we speak about uh, traffic calming, traffic calming is a subset of uh, complete streets. And traffic calming is not about uh, uh, reducing the travel length width. Traffic calming means uh, we use another um, tools to, to calm the traffic. And tools like chickens, like uh, build outs, like speed, ta speed tables, planting, textures, and other, and other tools. Um, we can reduce the speed with these tools. Complete street is not about uh, re uh, diminish the impervious area. And complete streets goes with, uh, always with uh, parking in, in because um, we have a destination, and any trip starts and finishes with a parking event. Um, in this context, um, we, support, uh, we don't support the application of complete strict uh, uh, concepts on this project, essentially because, uh, as, as I say, uh, we, have, uh, we don't have land use diversity. We don't have the, the possibility to, to perform short distance or local trips. Um, and because the reduction of the travel lane width um, is, is, is not a traffic calming um, tool. It is essentially a reduction of the asphalt where the vehicles circulate. With them, with them I am willing to answer any question. Uh, by the way, I, I, um, I am professional engineer, professional transportation planner, professional traffic operation engineer, and I have been served. Hmm. <laughs> Any questions for the board? Sorry. Uh, can I just make one qu question, please? Of course, sir. Uh, so good to see you as well, and I don't want you to think that I have any less esteem for you than our, our colleague, but uh, it's always good to see you. Thanks. Um, so would you describe the focus of the applicant on the completed street concept or the use that is designed for as kind of a misallocation, like an ill-fitting suit? This just doesn't really suit what the, the intention of the, the conduct was or the development that we're looking at. I mean, that, that's kind of the gist of what I got from your analysis. Yes, sir, you are right. It means uh, the main idea, as I see, as we see here, is the reduction of the travel uh, lane with, uh, without context, without, a, without the criteria to apply complete streets concepts uh, uh, as states on the uh, complete streets uh, handbook from Florida Department of Transportation. Mm -hmm. And... and I, I was interested in the thing you said that the reduction in the width of the streets was not intended to change impervious surface. In other words, it wasn't designed for anything other than I, I, I think of it as more something in downtowns and cities where you don't have room for some of the same thoroughfares and a green space to start from. Is that kind of your understanding of those the street criteria? Yes, it means we can say travel lane with reduction, but uh, in connecting the reduction of the travel lane with, with complete street is, uh, is, is a misfortune. It is, uh, it is not uh, what we expect uh, when we design the complete street manual. And it is, uh, I believe, the wrong application of a 
uh, policy on on the design that uh, the applicant proposed. Understood. Thank you. That's that's very helpful. Good to see you. Hope, hopefully, you stay safe. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Um, could you could you address the road the existing roads? No. Oh, yes. And the service. Of course. Um, Golf Gold Coast Road is an existing two-lane road with a 40 miles mile per hour posted speed. It's designated a four-lane collector roadway with a planned right-of-way with of 120 feet in the comprehensive plan's future traffic circulation plan. Spencer Parish Road is an existing two-lane road with a 30 miles per hour posted speed. It's uh, designed as four-lane collector roadway with planned uh, right-of-way of 120 feet in the comprehensive plan's future circulation plan. And Gene Davis Road is an existing two-lane road with a 30 miles per hour posted speed. Uh, again, it is designed, uh, des designated as two-lane collector roadway with a planned right-of-way of 84 feet in the comprehensive plan uh, future circulation plan. Um, there are no capacity issues uh, along these uh, roadways, uh, and the impacts um, um, have been determined on the traffic impact uh, statement um, at the recent level. And is the applicant required to improve uh, the roads along their boundary? The, the traffic impact statement is, uh, is, is for a reason. Um, it doesn't identify say, uh, specifically the um, uh, necessary improvements in order to um, mitigate uh, any uh, impact on the, the um, level of service of each road. It means at this stage, we don't know. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Not for this one. Is there uh, somebody from the school board here? I see we have a statement from them. If we could get that read in the... Records. Okay. No one here. Okay, thank you. Staff closing. Again, Jim Rigo from staff. I have been sworn. Um, is this an opportunity for closing as well? I take it. Okay, we do have the report from the school district, the, and I wanted to address the um, citizens' comments on that very topic. Um, in their uh, school report, they do confirm that uh, um, Williams Elementary, Buffalo Creek, and Parish Community High School has capacity for the additional, um, their computation for additional students for the development. Um, so I just wanted to answer that question. Um, and. Uh, I guess staff would just like to close by saying we appreciate the proffer of complete streets. Um, this request came fairly late in the game. We feel it was a reaction to the, uh, the, the specific approval denial. Um, we would have loved to have this uh, presented in a preliminary site plan to address the complete streets a little bit better. Nelson described it very well as it includes connectivity for not just vehicles, but pedestrians, inter-neighborhood ties, things of that nature. So um, we feel that uh, a plan at the preliminary site plan level could address a lot of those concerns. Um, that's all the comments I have. Any other questions? I'll be glad to address them now. So, Mr. Chair, before the board votes, can the applicant read into the record what the new stipulations are? There were two new stipulations, one, one about the wall. I can't, someone has to read in the record. Read the new ones. The buffer wall adjacent to the parcel to the west of the project may be constructed to a maximum of 20 feet tall 
which require buffer landscaping to be installed on the exterior side of the wall. Actual, actual height of the wall will be determined by the developer at time of final site plan. And the other uh, was to public work manuals part three, section 3.1, the applicant proposed the homeowner association or the community development district rules and regulation shall preclude, preclude on a street parking and the responsibility entity shall provide for the enforcement ther thereof in accordance with their respective rules and regulations and applicable law. And Mr. Chair, so the second stipulation change is to say the notice to buyers shall include those information. Mr. Vogel agreed to that. We can't stipulate what's in the HOA documents. It has to be the notice to buyers. Okay. Should include the no parking on yes, private streets. Correct. Yes. Okay. okay, I just want that in the record with the two changes. It's in the record. Thank you. Any more from the staff? You're all set? Okay. Mr. I, I wanted, can I clarify one point? Go ahead. I wanted to clarify that the two major incongruent points in this between staff and the developer are the width of the highways that that designing uh, and the size of the external wall. Are those the two significant deltas? Yes. 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 Hi, for the record, Anna Rittenauer. I just wanted to clarify, it's the width of local roads within the development, no highways. Understood. Uh, it's uh, just road widths. Understood. Um, it seems to me, as much time as Mr. Vogler spends with our team, that those two issues ought not to be the reason that this does not go forward. In my humble opinion, I think having a, a, a grandiose you know, 20-foot wall, in my experience, is expensive, uh, in harmonious with a good housing development. And I just am kind of surprised to see it, but that that's his decision. But that, that concerns me because it just doesn't seem appropriate anywhere, not next to the interstate. Uh, the second thing about the roadways, I'm less concerned about that, but the ins uncertainty of how much of the roads are that way. And if that's just a way to save paving rates at two square feet times the lineal development, I, I just am not inclined to make that exception. But Overall, I like the project. Overall, I think it addresses some water concerns. And overall, I think it will be an improvement. If you're not going to have cows there, then that's a good choice. So I just am curious this, if if the, if the Mr. Vogel or his team would like to respond to those two outstanding issues, how important they are to him. Well, I think we still need applicants' closing arguments. Yes. Well, that might, maybe that would be a great time for that, huh? This is a good time. But then we went back to staff, so I mean, don't they get staff should have gone first and then the right? Yep. We agree. Out of order, so yeah, I, I screwed it up. Let's get him to I, be able. To I speak. think we got a little out of order, but if you'll humor me, I'll, I, I will be thank uh, you responsive to the question and and answer um, the question. So, Mr. Rutledge, we we think we would probably not build a twenty foot wall, uh, but we don't know yet what is necessary to buffer those impacts. And so that's what we've proposed up to. Um, and so I think that answers your question because we would prefer not to build any wall really. The, the cost of a 20 foot wall versus 12 would be pretty significant because of the wind loading and the engineering that's gonna be required to be an, analyzed in connection with that. And so at general uh, development stage, uh, we, we ask for that so that we can have this authorization in a planned development project. As it relates to the complete streets, it, it is not uh, an economic uh, consideration. Uh, the, these are considerations that have to do more with modern planning and the movement of Manatee County towards something that they've already identified in the project design manual as available. And so when available, we'd like to utilize it because we think it makes a better community. But we don't resist the idea that, that at preliminary site plan and, and later final site plan, 
that the staff should have some input and involvement in that. And so if there were a stipulation that said the complete streets can be approved for GDP purposes, but stipulated such that the design will be approved by the staff at preliminary site plan level, we would be completely agreeable to that. And I will acknowledge that um, it, some of these things that are design specific are better to be presented at a preliminary site plan type concept. Right. And so if we could develop a stipulation that allows us to utilize the general development plan program, but not uh, make our professional staff and our planning commission members and our board members uncomfortable, then we can meld those two concepts together. And I know that if you'll allow us to go forward today, that we can work on that language either today or uh, in, in between the two meetings and to try to come to an understanding on that. And in almost every case, we do. And so I hope that answers your question, and I hope it gives you some comfort. Yes. yes. Uh, may I ask one other thing, Mr. Vogel? Where's the pond? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask if you could tell me the green space, the open open space in this particular development versus the minimum requirement of this kind of development. Well, I'm, I'm going to answer that this way. I think the open space criteria is like 26 and a half on our plan. Uh, um, and the criteria, the requirement is 25%. But what Mr. Gerstenberger said is entirely true that when you overlay the questions of floodplain management and stormwater management and the type of criteria that we're going to have to uh, implement, we're going to be dedicating a lot more land than as contemplated in the GDP. So when the engineering comes forward, for example, the testimony is, and, and we've asked for some relief, if we have to use the entire western side as uh, uh, floodplain management, there won't be a home there. It'll be used for floodplain management. All of that would be open space at that point in time. So the percentages will be, in the real world, will be much more significant than they show in the GDP. Understood. Okay. Thank you very much. Any deliberations? Any discussion? <clears throat> um, I, I would just say that I, I like the idea of bringing these floodplain areas that are going to be developed ultimately into the hands of good development thinking and contemporary teams. And I think they put together a good team. You know, we've got to depend on the engineers and some of the professionals they hire. I do think that this group will not want to disappoint anybody by not addressing this, these two outstanding issues. I don't necessarily agree with the, the, the the manipulation of a design for their use, but it's not clear enough to say that the city streets thing is clear. So I, I'm going to be in favor of moving this forward with the expectation that what we see today is to give them the broadest range and they'll bring it back into some kind of finish that we like. And the commission will have the opportunity to see if they've done that. Mr. Chair, I think Rosina was going to say something. I... Oh, Sorry. We would like to clarify that um, staff consider that the project, the overall project, is in compliance with the land development code and the comprehensive plan, that only we are not supporting the specific approvals related to the wall and to the reduce the width of the roads. Okay. If I may? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I, I just, we, we do have a, a an approval here with that that language in it. So if you know we want to go in that direction, we can. But I also want to take a second to address the uh, the first public speaker who was disappointed that we weren't the county commission. Um, so <laughs> just for your benefit, um, things come before us, the planning commission, and then if we approve it, or I guess even if we don't approve it, it goes to the county commission. So you'll have an opportunity to speak again uh, to the county commission. So um, and they're a lot nicer than we are. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know about that. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, any I other would like to make a motion. Ahead. Have it in front of me. I'd like to make a motion to accept it with the two exceptions as provided by staff. 
guy's good second. friend. Second. Do I need so, a second? Do we need to read So, that does that mean you're, you're recommending approval of everything but those two specific approvals? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the, the second paragraph there had the denial in it. Um, everything changed. Uh, so basically, it's the motion, the update memo, with denial of the two specific approvals. One is 511-6C to increase height of the fence or wall from 9 feet to 20 feet in length for, for a length of 1,382 linear feet. And the other one is to recommend denial of the specific approval of Public Works Manual Part 3, Section 3.1.3. To allow a reduction to the travel lane pavement width from 12 feet to 10 feet in width. And does your motion include the two um, modified stipulations submitted by the applicant? One had to do with the wall and one had to do with the. <clears throat> I'd, li I'd like to make a motion keeping with that. Go ahead. Try us again. Yes, yeah, sorry. I'd like to make the motion in keeping with the staff's recommendation. Can you paraphrase it from what's written? Uh, pr probably. Hold on, my computer just went blank. No, I probably can't. Somebody else would have to make that motion. I, I think I've made my point. So. All right, we'll we'll do it here. Go ahead. I just read it. Yeah. So, Mr. Chair, that means. It's the recommendation for approval with the recommend, although recommend denial of the two specific approvals I just read. Yes. Yes, correct. correct. That's my motion. And I second it still. It's seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we're missing with three, four. Any, anything else? So the vote is what now? Four, four zero. Four, four zero. Four. Four zero. And the meeting is, unless there's something else. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ross. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the only other item of uh, discussion is for the planning commissioners. Um, they asked for a volunteer for the affordable housing committee. And uh, um, if it's okay with you, I'd like to volunteer. I, I have an interest in affordable housing, so unless anybody else has a, a right overriding right. desire to do that. So, okay. On the city Nothing for punishment. Okay. All right. With that, um, we're going to go ahead and call the meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was on the, the city of.